everyone to the May 14th, 2020 work session of the Rifle County School Board. As you can see, this meeting is being held electronically due to the Commonwealth's current declared state of emergency and Governor Northam's stay-at-home order issued on March 23rd and in effect until June 10th, 2020. This meeting is being live streamed on the HCPS website and is also being audio recorded. Notice of today's meeting was provided via a public service announcement on Friday, May the 8th, 2020. I would like to note that the school board is addressing only matters the board considers essential, the essential business of the school division, and all the votes will be by roll call and recorded in the minutes. I ask that any board member verbally note if you need to leave the meeting and subsequently verbally note when you return. Board members, do you have any questions about the process? We will begin our meeting with the roll call. When I call your name, please verbally indicate your presence. Ms. Atkins? Present. Ms. Kinsella? Present. Ms. Ogborn? Ms. Ogborn? I'm here. Ms. Shea? Present. Thank you. Please let the record reflect that a quorum of the board is present. The first item on our agenda is the approval of our agenda. Can I have a motion and a second for the approval of the agenda? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Sheikh. Do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Kinsella. I'll do a roll call vote. Ms. Atkins? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Aye. Ms. Ogborn? Aye. Ms. Shea? Aye. And I vote aye. The agenda is approved. The next item on the agenda is a closed session for discussion of matters covered under items A1, A2, and A8 of section 2.2-3711 of the Code of Virginia. As pertaining to the assignment, appointment, performance, disciplining, and release of contract for specific board employees, school board employees, the mission and discipline of specific students and consultation with legal counsel regarding specific legal matters related to holding electronic meetings of the school board. Can I have a motion and a second to go into closed session, please? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Ogborn. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Atkins. I'll now proceed with the roll call vote. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogborn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. We will now go into closed session. For our listening and viewing audience, we will reconvene the work session at the conclusion of our closed meeting. We want to, we want to certify our closed session. Um, can I receive a motion to um, certify our closed session? A motion in a second? So moved. It's been moved by Mrs. Kinsella. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Shea. All those in favor, please respond by saying aye on roll call vote. Ms. Atkins? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Aye. Ms. Ogborn? Aye. Ms. Shea? Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The readmissions have um, been approved. As far as, I'm sorry, the closed session has been certified. Madam Superintendent? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. For the first item, which is related to my request for readmission of students who um, had previously been expelled, I would like to make the public aware that I have withdrawn my recommendation for the readmission of student case number 17-18-S-8. However, I am seeking the board's approval for my recommendation to readmit student case number 18 dash 19 dash s dash 21 and again names of students are protected under the virginia freedom of information act thank you so much madam superintendent um, board members you have heard the request for readmission of the one student case from our superintendent i will now ask for a motion and a second
I think we said the wrong case number. If we just want to restate that. Um, it should I'm be, uh, I'm with. seeking readmission for student case number 18-19-S-28. Thank you so much, Madam Superintendent. May I receive a motion and a second, please? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Shea. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Atkins. I will now proceed with the roll call vote. Ms. Atkins? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Aye. Ms. Ogborn? Aye. Mrs. Shea? Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The readmission has been approved. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. For the next item, I'm seeking uh, the board's approval for the appointment of administrative personnel. Board members, you have heard uh, the request for the approval of administrative appointments. Can I please receive a motion and a second? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Kinsella. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Shade, am I correct? Ms. Ogburn. Ms. Ogborn. Thank you, Ms. Ogborn. Um, you've heard the motion and the second. Um, I will now proceed with the roll call vote. Ms. Atkins? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Aye. Mrs. Ogborn? Aye. Mrs. Shea? Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The motion, um, the administrative appointments have been approved. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. The board has just approved Erica Browdy, principal at Wilder Middle School, and Kenneth Dale King, principal at A Center Hermitage. And so for the next item, I am seeking the board's um, adoption of the previously approved fiscal year 2020-2021 annual financial plan with amendments. And so I um, ask that Mr. Sorensen provide the board with an overview again of the financial plan with amendments for your consideration as I am asking um, for you to adopt that. Mr. Sorensen. Thank you, Dr. Cashwell. Good afternoon, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I do want to walk through some slides to update. Uh, obviously, a lot has occurred since uh, you approved the budget back in February. So I want to walk through some of those, those changes with you. Um, from a budget perspective, the resources we thought we had available in February are no longer available, unfortunately. So we have gone back and worked with, with, with the county and through the leadership of the uh, school board and the board of supervisors. We have several changes that I'm going to walk through with you this afternoon. Uh, one is um, the budget that I'm going to walk through in a minute is four and a half million dollars less than the current 1920 budget. That's the current budget. Um, it does include funding for the employer's share of any health insurance increase. And it does fully fund the VRS rate increase that was in the state's budget. However, to balance the projected revenue available, all other initiatives approved by you in February are no longer funded in the budget I'm gonna walk through. So this, th this slide before you now is a summary of, of, of the budget. Again, it's based on the current budget, uh, the FY1920 adopted budget of $514.4 million. The next two lines are $3 million each for the items I just went over, the employer health share, uh, employer share of health insurance increase and the VRS increase. So the 514.4 plus the $6 million takes us to $520.4 million. However, based on available revenue to us or projected revenue uh, available to us, we have a target of $509.9 .9 million. That's a difference of $10.5 million that we went back through the budget and had, had to reduce. When we went through that process, there were several priorities that we kept in mind. Obviously, this is something that no one wanted to do. And we realized that we were all very excited about the budget you all approved in February. And we realized that we needed to be careful in how we went through and made reductions to come into balance with our new target. So the top priority was to preserve a strong instructional program that we have for our students. And to look at reductions to minimize the impact to students and employees, reductions that minimize the classroom, and reductions that have the least operational impact. 
the likely reductions that we're looking at. And of course, we, we do have a plan. We're, we're ongoing looking at, at different options as we as we meet with staff and lay out um, some of the options before us. But the likely reductions we, uh, is a hiring freeze that's been announced previously. Also to reduce travel and training, to reduce discretionary department, school level spending, to reduce some of the textbook money. You all had taken a great initiative and added uh, about $900,000 in new textbook money. Unfortunately, we're looking at that as one of the, the reductions to balance. And also to look at some of our extracurricular activities. Um, that would be the activities themselves and the staffing and maybe how we can how we can do some things differently uh, moving forward. This is a slide that you normally see. There are a couple extra columns that I, I want to I walk through just to uh, be transparent for everyone. So these are the funds, the general fund, debt service, school nutrition, state and federal grants, and there's a new fund that you have not seen on the slide before. That's the Children's Services Act. So I'll walk through that piece in just a minute. But working from left to right across the page is the current 1920 adopted budget for each one of those funds. What you guys approved back in February, the FY 2021 approved budget, and what we're asking you to adopt this afternoon, the FY 2021 adopted budget. The next column over is the dollar change from adopted to adopted, with the percentage change from adopted to adopted. So for the general fund, that's the 509.9 that I referenced in an earlier slide. The debt service, again, the county manages our debt service. They went through and to look how they could uh, refinance a few things, and that number has fallen a little bit from the approved budget that was before you. School nutrition, it does show a slight increase. That was uh, something that occurred in the budget process. School nutrition will not spend additional money. They'll look, they'll have the same restrictions on their department with their spending as, as the general fund departments do. State and federal grants stay flat between the approved budget and the adopted budget. So now for Children's Services Act, this fund has, has traditionally been budgeted on, on the, the county side. And moving forward, um, because a large piece of that budget is related to schools, the decision has been made to include that in, in the school's budget. So $10.3 million is the budget we're asking you to adopt for that. Um, you, you guys know that that is that is a cost that we have been watching closely over the past few years. It, it has increased significantly over the past few years. Moving forward, we'll work with the county to uh, to maintain that budget and and should the need arise for additional funding, work with the county to get additional funding for that throughout the fiscal year. Um, Code RVA is at the bottom of that screen. Again, Code RVA has their own school board, their own management, but because the funds go through our financial system, we, we, we do like to disclose their budget uh, on our slides. What's before you today is the operating budget, and what I've talked about so far is everything related to the operating budget, but I think it is important that you all realize some changes to the, to the CIP. So, all the items that were approved by you um, earlier in November have been removed from the budget. So the request is still there to show our need, but the funding has been removed for all of our items in, in the CIP. I've listed a couple things on this slide just to, uh, to point out to you in particular, roofing mechanical funding has been eliminated and the school bus replacement has been eliminated. So these are two items that, that may impact our operating budget. Um, because there's no money in the CIP, should we have an issue with with roofing or, or mechanical systems, we would need to find money for that for those items. And the school bus replacement, obviously, as we we keep older buses on the road, the likelihood for increased maintenance costs uh, in, increases. So those two CIP things in particular may impact our operating budget moving forward. And then. Typically in the budget presentation with the next step slide, I uh, just wanted to, to show that again, the, the county did delay their budget adoption from April 28th as originally advertised to May 12th in order to gather more information from the community. They did in fact adopt the budget on Tuesday night. Today is the 14th, the budget's before you for approval, and then it will go into place in, on July 1st. The ongoing line I mentioned in an earlier slide, we, we, we have a plan to move forward but it's, it's been a fast process and we want to make sure that we're strategic in our cuts to, to minimize the impact. So we will continue to look at our budget, continue to, to talk to staff to get ideas to make sure that we're, we're cutting the least impactful things from our budget and we'll continue to do that over the next several weeks. So that is my budget presentation and if I may have the courtesy to take just one minute, um, I 
uh, can't begin to express my gratitude for, for everyone for all their help, the leadership from the school board, the uh, continuous support and leadership from the superintendent, and all of DLT. Um, it's been a, it's been a team process to get to this point. We've reached out to department directors, to all sorts of staff, to ask for quick information so we can make decisions and move forward. And the response has been unbelievable. So I, I just wanted to take one minute uh, to express my gratitude for everyone to help us get to this point. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Sorensen, as well, for uh, your hard work and your heavy lifting um, in collaboration with our superintendent and your peers um, at the county government to get us to this point. Um, and we are all grateful for your um, hard work and your, your service. Um, quickly, we want to um, open it up for questions or comments from my peers. I'm going to begin with Ms. Shea. Oh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Reverend Dr. Cooper. Um, I do have a couple of questions for you, Mr. Sorensen. Um, some points of clarification um, for the public watching. Um, can you please clarify what we mean by a hiring freeze? Are we freezing all open positions or are we going to prioritize and fill some instructional positions? That's excellent. Excellent question, uh, Ms. Shea. No, our classroom positions uh, would not be frozen. We will continue to work to do uh, certainly classroom positions and many instructional positions are not frozen. We will we, we, we'll, we'll hire those. The central office and other operational positions, we will look at those on a case by case basis and, and make a determination if we should fill it or not and move forward. Great, thank you. And another clarification point, I know um, when a lot of our constituents see extracurricular activities on the list of possible cuts, um, I know that's gonna raise a lot of concern. Um, so if you could please explain um, how how those cuts are related to um, the stipends and, and just a little bit of clarity around that piece, I'd appreciate it. Sure, so the, the extracurricular would, would, would not be sports programs. They're, they weren't even part of the discussion. Some of the extracurricular activities are things that take place in the school, typically beyond the, the, the um, work hours, the contracted hours of staff. So we would look at how we could reassign some of those some of those tasks to different staff to do within their their uh, contracted hours, but it would not impact at this point uh, clubs or sports of, of any type. Um, or music programs, correct? Or music programs, correct. Great, right. thank you so much. And my last question um, is around the CARES Act monies. So I know we're receiving money for the CARES Act, but we did not infuse that into our general budget to fill the gaps. Um, so if you could just provide some context on why they are not being used to fill budget gaps um, and, and what instead we forecast that they may be used for, please. Sure. So our CARES Act, the initial communication from the Department of Education is, will receive approximately $9.3 million. And those funds are intended to help us respond to the, the, the impact of COVID. So uh, we would look at some of our instructional needs as a response to uh, perhaps online learning, uh, different programs over the summer to continue education. It, it's really enhancements, uh, extra things we need to do related to COVID versus filling in um, budget gaps at this point. You know, All if, right. I might, if, if, if I might add to that, uh, Mr. Sorensen's response, uh, Mrs. Shea, to your question. And so, you know, he gave the example of, you know, instructional needs that have arisen simply because of COVID uh, related to being able to pivot to online instruction, fill gaps of learning loss, not only this summer, but into the coming school year, um, but also things we've uh, mobilized in relation to providing um, access to meals above and beyond what we, in the manner we typically would um, do that during the school day. So um, anything that has been a response to COVID and, and, of course, has come at cost of the school division would be um, eligible potentially for reimbursing those costs through CARES and then looking at potential future costs we'll incur based on the COVID crisis. Thank you, Dr. Cashwell uh, and Mr. Sorensen. That concludes my questions, but I just um, want to take a moment to comment and just um, my profound appreciation to Mr. Sorensen and the, and the superintendent uh, and the other board members for your truly tireless work on turning um, every stone uh, to look at where we can have savings and, and prioritizing our staff and their salaries, their benefits, and their job retention. Um, and it's just, um, that's been so crucial to all of us as we move forward on this. Um, because our, our our staff is really the heart of what we do, 
um, so that we can serve our students. Um, and I think that has been of paramount importance um, and the way that your team has continued um, to prioritize that has been huge. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Shea, for your sentiments and question. Mrs. Ogborn. Ms. Kinsella goes before me. I think, oh, no, we're going me first. Okay, fine. Um, well, question, I, um, and question and comments, you know, this is different than roll call vote. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Just wanted, real quick, um, wanted to uh, thank Mr. Sorensen. This, because uh, Reverend Cooper and I were in um, a lot of those um, budget meetings and it, it, it was stressful to say the least. And getting to this point, I think we're in a good place, but I do want to thank um, everyone for their attention, like Mrs. Shea said, to preserving our employees first. And that's crucial to meeting the needs of our kids. But I wanted to, I've had this question, so I thought I would uh, pass it along. Mr. Sorensen, if you could address where our meals tax, what little bit the county will be collecting since most restaurants are closed or limited in what they're doing, where will the meals tax dollars that are collected by the county be allocated? I've I, I know the answer, but I just thought we'd bring it out there so the public is aware. Right. So uh, it, it, historically, the meals tax has been broken out about $10 million in the um, operating budget and $9 million in the capital budget. And so uh, the $9 million in the capital budget will go towards the construction of, of, of the new schools. But generally, we have those for, for smaller capital projects. That money is, it will now be used for the funding of, of, of the schools. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Auburn. Next, Ms. Kinsella. Yes, thank you. I would just like to, um, before I get to a few questions, I'd like to echo the sentiments of fellow board members and, and thank everyone um, that focused on job preservation and benefits to our employees and staff, quite frankly, on both sides. I believe it was unanimous on both teams. So thank you for to everyone for all of their work. Um, throughout this process, we've heard about ad backs and quarterly appropriations of funds as they may become available. Um, Mr. Sorensen, can you tell me what some of our priorities might be? I'm hoping they're, they include counselors and reading specialists. Um, I think these are uh, needed now more than ever after this time? Correct. I think as, as the money comes comes available to us, we would, we would look at our most pressing needs are at that time um, and uh, address those needs as they come on. So I guess at this point, counselors will certainly be higher on the list. There may be some CARES money to address those needs. I think we just have to look at the resources available to us uh, in, in different formats to see what how we would add things back on to the budget. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you, everyone, for, for their working together on this. Thank you so much, Ms. Kinsella. Ms. Atkins? Uh, thank you, Chairman Cooper, and thank you, Mr. Sorensen and team uh, for, for all of, of your work. I do have a, a question regarding the CARES money. Um, can we make sure or try to prioritize providing work from home and virtual training for our staff uh, and, and particularly nurses as well as, um, you know, as we know, teachers went from, you know, providing instruction in a classroom quickly to providing instruction at home. And so I'm hopeful that some of that, that CARES money can aid uh, with appropriate training and learning uh, not only how to work from home, but to work virtually. And in, in some, in some cases, we have many teachers and staff working virtually and trying to provide instruction with their children in the home and other individuals in the home. So I'm hopeful we will really be proactive in providing appropriate training uh, for that. And then I also want to just show my deepest appreciation for the teachers and supportive staff that are using their own money to increase internet bandwidth and all kinds of phone data plans just to make sure that they accommodate the requirements of virtually working and working from home. And I, I recognize that each of you out there that are listening and, you know, educational professionals, you do this because you're committed and you understand the value of education. And so um, not only 
you know, is the school board working hard? Folks in other areas on the budget are working hard, but so are our teachers and supportive staff working hard on how we can move forward with these budget cuts. And so I uh, certainly wanted to make sure that that I showed my deepest appreciation for folks using their own money to increase, you know, that internet and bandwidth and, and finding different data plans that will allow them uh, to be effective in their jobs. And that is it for me, Chairman Cooper. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, President Atkins. Now that we've all had an opportunity to share our comments as well as ask our questions, I'm going to need a motion and a second um, so we can adopt the FY 2020-21 annual financial plan with amendments. May I please have a motion and a second? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Ogborn. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Atkins. Thank you, ladies. I will now proceed with the roll call vote. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogborn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The FY 2020 21 annual financial plan has been adopted with amendments. Madam Superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the board. And um, the next item that I have is related to the school division's uh, response due to uh, the COVID pandemic. And so um, our, our chief of staff, Dr. Tigan, is going to provide for you an overview uh, that touches on um, the efforts that are really happening across the department and certainly represent uh, the tremendous efforts that each of the um, our areas have put into play since this um, began in March, and we've been updating you along the way. So we'll sort of provide a look at what's new and um, some of the efforts that are underway to plan for the sustained efforts um, in response to COVID-19, even as we begin thinking about the fall. So Dr. Teigen, I'll turn it over to you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the school board and Dr. Cashwell. I am going to provide you an, an update on the efforts across the school division that, to support our students, their families, and our staff. I would like to start by um, putting a caveat that based on the recent governor's briefing, the Emergency Operations Center has shared the following information. Um, there are three phases to the Forward Virginia plan, and each phase is expected to last two weeks or longer. The health data that the governor's office is looking at when making the determinations of moving from um, current state to phase one, phase two, phase three, is based on the confirmed positive cases by report reported data to the Virginia Department of Health, the number of people who are being tested each day, and how many tests come back positive, and also how many hospitals are showing um, shortages of personal protective devices and they're looking for a downward trend. They're monitoring the hospital capacity and um, how many people who have COVID are hospitalized. Um, and th that's those are the rationale for moving from phase one to phase two to phase three. Phase one is scheduled to start tomorrow. And the stay at home order will change to a safe at home order. And with the financial plan, I know you've just received an update from Chris Sorensen, so there's no need for me to provide additional information to you this evening. When we look at our operations um, division in the facilities, the maintenance and custodial personnel continue to open and close our grab and go meal preparation sites each day. And this often includes assisting the building, um, providing access to our school nutrition services to retrieve food from other schools. Um, we are utilizing our stocked food from other schools to provide um, meals for right now. And so this has helped us to um, save some expense while still meeting the needs of our families. Um, facilities has also helped with preparing Tuckahoe Middle School for the Virginia Department of Health for COVID testing that will begin on the 21st of May. And this is expected to be a weekly testing site for the foreseeable future. 
Facilities will be providing assistance in school closures as teachers and students collect their belongings and cleaning and disinfecting the schools before people arrive and after they leave each day of this collection process. In addition to these things, the facilities department helped facilitate a blood drive for the Red Cross on Saturday, April 18th, and is planning to facilitate an, another one on June 13th. For the technology department, last Monday and Tuesday, they began phase two distribution of Chromebooks to elementary students. To date, we have deployed 5,678 Chromebooks. As more Chromebooks have been distributed, each tech hub now has both a secondary and an elementary TST on site for even greater supports of our students and their families. On Tuesday, technology began phase three of the Chromebook deployment for those families that were unable to attend one of the seven phase one or phase two distribution sites. Elementary parents can now visit one of our four tech hubs five days a week to pick up a Chromebook for their family's use. As stated in our last update, HEF has been promised $80,000 from Facebook to provide additional hotspots with a 12-month service contract for our students, and these additional 200 hotspots should be delivered shortly. The county's demand on these items are the reason for the delay, I'm sorry, the country, um, and so that will be essential to getting those out to some of our elementary families at this point. Technology provided support to hold our first virtual school board meeting last month and our second one today. As we look ahead, technology be will begin the network refresh project on May 26th. This refresh will be completed for all network equipment in our high schools and all access points in our middle and elementary schools. Each high school will take approximately three days to complete the, um, the refresh, and it'll take one day for each one of the elementary and each of the middle schools. The, so the work is expected to run through the first week of August. Of course, this will mean that facilities department will be opening buildings for technology staff performing the network refresh effort and be present while the work is being conducted. There will be health screenings of the project team members before they enter the buildings and will follow all COVID safety requirements. As far as transportation, our bus drivers have and will continue to support our weekend feeding programs. And as we look at our food nutrition, a new grab and go meal site was added, was opened at Lakeside Elementary on Monday of this week and all has gone very well. The total number of meals served during the pandemic passed a quarter of a million mark this week. School Nutrition Services is awaiting guidance from the Virginia Department of Education on the implementation of the summer feeding program. Once we receive guidance, we will update the community on the details of this program. School Nutrition Services continues to work with distributors to monitor current and future food supply. Menu adjustments are made accordingly and DLT will be updated if any concerns arise. School Nutrition Services submitted the data required by the Virginia Department of Social Services that will help to implement the Pandemic Electronic Benefit Transfer or the, e, the Pandemic EBT cards. And this benefits are calculated on a rate of $5.70 per day per child for the 66 days Virginia schools will be closed from the beginning of the pandemic. The total benefit is $376 per eligible student and benefits will be provided for eligible students only and not for other children in the household. So if there's um, pre-K students or other 18 year olds that have already graduated, they would not be eligible. And the families are eligible and currently receiving the SNAP programs, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program benefits. The additional funds will just be added to their current EBT cards in the next two weeks. For families who are not already participating in SNAP, the, the pandemic EBT card should arrive in the mail in the next four to six weeks. And at this point, I'd like to pause and see if you have any questions or comments um, related to the topics we've discussed thus far.
Okay. Thank with you. So operations, much. school nutrition. So operations and school nutrition. Thank you, Madam. Mrs. Atkins, any questions or comments? Uh, thank you, Chairman Cooper. I do. I, I really want to thank uh, Mrs. Kinsella um, for advocacy efforts in getting a lakeside grab and go site up and running. I want to thank uh, Nutrition Services uh, for coordination and, and getting that lakeside grab and go site up and running as quickly as possible. I'd like to thank FACE. Our family and community engagement team, they are working furiously on weekends and getting uh, meals out uh, to families and doing this in a safe way and making sure that the uh, families have basic needs. So I just want to give those, those kudos uh, because it is critically important that we get families fed. And I'm grateful um, that, you know, we are a team and we're doing everything we can to make sure that families are fed. Pastor Cooper, the floor is back to you. Thank you so much, Ms. Atkins. Ms. Kinsella. Yes, thank you, Reverend Cooper. Um, I have a question. Thank you, Ms. Atkins and uh, the board and leadership, school nutrition, everyone that worked to get Lakeside Grab and Go up and running so so quickly. I'm, I'm grateful on behalf of the Brooklyn District. Um, I had a question as to... Um, the technology for you, Dr. Tigan, have we found we that there are any gaps with technology with our students or is it or our staff? Um, and how are we assisting them with that? The um, information that I'm aware of of gaps are related to the needing um, internet access. And so I know that Brian Maddox and his team have been keeping a list of families that have requested hotspots. And as soon as those devices um, come in, he will make sure, he and his team will make sure that they get to those families. Um, we, there are some families that had issues, um, per, you know, real, and they varied what the, what the issue was of getting to one of the Chromebook distribution sites. And so that's why there's been the additional push. We've also been working with um, the with County Mental Health as they've been able to refer some families to us um, that needed help, and we're working with them to make sure that families know how to how they can acquire a Chromebook. So I think the collaboration, not only within Henrico County Public Schools, but with some of the departments within Henrico County are helping us to identify and meet those gaps. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Tigan. You're welcome. I, I might add one comment related to the gaps, and, and certainly do Dr. Tigan covered it, and, and another piece that is maybe not an immediate gap, but is uh, presenting itself uh, the longer we remain in virtual instruction. Uh, and that is when we first uh, identified needs for our elementary students to have a device to participate in virtual learning, um, you know, our take was looking at providing one device per elementary family or household. And so it certainly doesn't mean uh, that every elementary student who needed one to access instruction have, has one. And so in many cases, we provided one to a family and we're hearing from families where there are multiple elementary children, what some of those challenges are um, as the number of virtual sessions with teachers is increasing and so on. So we want to be mindful of that and position ourselves to fully understand uh, what that difference is between the number of devices we have out and our total number of students um, who may need one if we move fully to that one-to-one -one situation in the elementary. Thank you, Dr. Cashwell. I appreciate that. Have we found, again, a technology question? Are the hubs, I would imagine, um, are able to answer some of the technological questions? Uh, students and staff are experiencing, many of them having never um, done virtual distance learning. Yes, and, and as Dr. Tigan said, the addition of the TSTs uh, at those sites, I think, will just increase the level of support and service that we're able to provide rather than just from the technical um, aspects. Uh, there's some of that as well as, of course, the support that um, our, our school staff can provide even virtually for our families as they're becoming more accustomed to the virtual platforms. And Dr. Tigan, I'll, I'll let you take that from there. 
Absolutely. And I, I will say, too, that um, technology has a hotline. So that's another way where parents and students can access help without having to leave their home. And also the call center. I know a lot of our folks are able to walk families through to help them find the resources on our website. And sometimes that's all they need. And so there are multiple avenues in addition to their schools and their, te- you know, their administrators and their teachers to get assistance. Um, so I think that uh, across the, with all the supports we have, um, that helps to meet all the needs of our families. We've right. even done some some support that's, you know, with our um, non-English speaking families and using interpreters to help with that. Great. Thank you, Reverend Cooper. That's all I have. Thank you so much, Mrs. Kinsella. Um, next, I'm going to go to Mrs. Ogborn. Ms. Ogborn? I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, okay. Just just wanted to uh, thank Ms. Kinsella real quickly for bringing the needs of, of the Brooklyn District to our attention and making sure that was set up. Like Ms. Adkin said, I, I, I think we were, you know, that's our role right now is being a funnels for information and advocacy. So thank you very much, Christy, for that. But that's all I had. Thank you. Short and sweet. Thank you so much, Ms. Ogborn. I'm um, last, but certainly not least, Ms. Shea. Thank you, Reverend Cooper. Um, I just have uh, one question concerning our school nutrition services, and that is um, how long do we forecast that these programs are sustainable and or how long um, have they been planned to continue? I don't know if Chris is going to jump in. If not, I've, I'm happy to respond. Um, the Currently, we have not received any information from the Virginia Department of Education about being able to implement the summer program starting right after the end of the school year. So we're anticipating that we will hear something from them shortly that will help provide us guidance. Um, you know, I think we're prepared to continue to feed students as long as um, the food supplies are available. We continue to monitor. Right now, we are able to get the shelf-stable foods that we need, but that may change. Um, we may also need to change the model as we go through the summer um, by providing additional meals at fewer times during the week rather than um, doing five days a week. So, you know, we continue to monitor and talk about uh, the prognosis of, of continuing to feed through the summer. Thank you. That's all I had, uh, Dr. Cooper. Madam, Ms. Ms. Shea, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Tigan, would you please pr- pr- proceed with your presentation? Absolutely. So we'll, we'll move on to community support. Um, as Ms. Atkins said, the, the current efforts on the Henrico County Public Schools food care scarcity response um, are being managed in collaboration with the Henrico general government the Henrico Education Foundation, the Schools Division of Equity, Diversity, and Opportunities, as well as family and community engagement. Operations have been centralized at Newbridge Learning Center on Tuesdays and Thursdays um, in the mornings, as well as the Richmond International Raceway um, Monday through Friday uh, during the day. And that's where the food is stockpiled at this point and and prepared for delivery to families and to food banks. Every two weeks, family and community engagement with the support of the equity, diversity and opportunity team support food pantries that are located in close proximity to our students and families that need support. And that's really key because that's getting the food you know, if there are transportation issues, getting the food closer to our families and needs allows it, makes it more accessible. In the first six weeks, um, the first week, six pantries were supplied with 50 food bags each um, for 300 total. And yesterday, 17 pantries received 25 to 100 bags, depending on the number of families that they serve. Um, allowing a total of a thousand food bags to go out to our families. 
The goal is to be connected to pantries that are accessible and provide varying days and times for families to visit. There's also weekly emergency food bags that are given to our schools for our vulnerable families. And this is also done on a weekly basis. As families are identified, a staff representative is able to pick up food and drop off items to those families. This happens every Thursday. And on the first day, which was last week, 302 bags were distributed. And this week we had 312 food bags distributed. And last month I shared that HEF has collaborated with Henrico County Public Schools to distribute funds donated by the Robbins family to families with significant needs. And as a result, HEF provided 200 families with a $500 one-time stipend. And just recently, funds to support another 200 families were donated to HEF by the Robbins Foundation. So certainly um, helping to keep our, our families cared for during this time. And our school nurses, our nursing team continues to be um, out and about supporting in multiple fashions. They support, continue to support the Virginia Department of Health and 911 emergency call centers each day, and as well as um, completing health screenings around the county for different um, groups of, of our staff that are out working. Most recently, they screened the IT staff prior to the elementary Chromebook distributions and will begin screening um, the team each day during the network refresh that's beginning in less than two weeks. Overall, the nurse team has completed over 1,000 screenings. Um, the Henrico Health Department has asked those that are active with the Medical Reserve Corps, often referred to as the MRC, to help with contact tracing. That's something you're gonna to continue to hear more about as we have an active case of COVID being to track the connections to who has um, been in contact with that individual to help um, identify people at risk in the spread of COVID. Several nurses have actually had spent some of their extra time sewing masks, which were provided to staff with community contact um, during school board, our school board on um, acti for activities. And over 300 masks have been made and the sewing is continuing. Most importantly, our nurses are beginning to the task of educating our staff and community um, at each of these opportunities when they're screening about how to be safe, how to keep others safe and other health related symptoms that require them to stay home or self isolate. So I'll stop and see if you have any questions on the community support or our nursing. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Tigan. Uh, Ms. J. I don't have any questions at this time. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. J. Ms. Ogborn. Nothing from me. Thank you, Madam. Ms. Kinsella. I just wanted to again express my gratitude to to everyone that's that's making it work while we're distance and trying to meet the needs of our families and keeping everyone safe and healthy. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kinsella. Last but certainly not least, Ms. Atkins. Thank you, Chairman Cooper. I do um, have have a more of a comment and an ask. Um, one, my comment is for all of the nurses that are doing stellar work and being grand examples of kindness and compassion, and as well as sharing their wisdom as they try to uh, educate others. That that was the comment, and I'll move forward with the ask. I'd like to receive a summary of our nurses' activity. Uh, of course, Dr. Cashwell, you can determine sort of the frequency, but I'd like to be um, more abreast of all that our nurses are doing. Uh, it will really help me be connected a little bit better with with what they're doing as I'm in the community as well. I think that, you know, me as a school board uh, representative, it's, it's hard because we're not as connected as we would be or as I would be um, if schools were open and hearing all of the marvelous activity that our nurses are doing, I'd love uh, to get uh, a report, very high level report of all this activity of our nurses that is so far beyond uh, what they would normally be doing uh, when schools are open. And so that is is my ask. Chairman yes, Cooper? 
Yes, ma'am. Madam Superintendent, you want to reply to that? Certainly, you're you're absolutely right. Our nursing staff is above, going above and beyond in so many ways, and be happy to detail um, examples of that um, on a frequent basis. So you are tuned into what those endeavors are. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Dr. Tigan, please proceed. Absolutely. And now we are on to graduation celebration 2020. So the senior year for the class of 2020 has been anything but typical. And Henrico County Public Schools is really making sure its commencement festivities will be just as unique. Um, each of our high schools will celebrate its seniors in a three-part graduation celebration 2020. The three events will include a virtual graduation ceremony watch party, a graduation victory lap at the Richmond Raceway, and a cap and gown photo session for each graduate capturing the moment they accept their diploma. The events will enable the graduates and their families and friends to mark this special occasion while also keeping health and safety at the center of what we're doing. You know, the graduation watch party, this TV, video, and social media event will enable graduates and their families to watch and experience commencements from the safety of their home, um, which is key. And it will include many of the elements that we think of as a traditional graduation with the student recognitions and speeches and remarks by the local dignitaries, including you all as school board members and the superintendent. It is during this event that the seniors will be officially pronounced as graduates. And then the graduate victory lap will come later in that same graduation week. The second element of graduation will give seniors and their families a chance to, to gather and process and process safely as a group while enjoying what we think will be a once in a lifetime opportunity for most of them. The, the Raceway has offered the use of America's premier short track for a grand vi graduation victory lap where graduate, graduates and their immediate family members will parade in car cars around the historic oval. Richmond Raceway's pace car will lead the graduate and his or her family in the car with family and friends, maybe even have decorated that car for this special event. They will cruise toward Victory Lane where their principal will be there with the checkered flag as they cross, as that graduate crosses the finish line and the names will be announced in front of the school members and the local dignitaries. And then to complete the celebration, cap and gown photos will be scheduled during specific days and times at each high school. And we'll, they'll be able to have an eight by 10 photo provided that's done by a professional photographer at each of our high schools. And they will provide, um, this is an opportunity to really capture that special moment that you put in a photo frame of being, when that graduate is presented with the diploma. So I'll stop and see if you have any questions or comments about our graduation celebration. Um, thank you, Dr. Tigan. Before I um, ask my peers to interject or to ask questions, can you also briefly for me just speak to the fact that we are also conscious of um, graduates who may not have access to transportation to participate? Will you speak to how we're going to make sure that it's equitable for those families who may not have transportation in that regards? Absolutely. Um, our very own Mac Baton is working with some of our business partners to make sure that there are vehicles there for families who may need that. Um, and there will be transportation. I'm going to say, but I'm not 100% sure that there's going to be transportation to the track for families if they need it. Uh, if I might interject, our, our principals are working to identify any families that may have that need. And similar to um, students who may have had issue getting to the Siegel Center, uh, we're handling it in that same manner on a case-by-case -case basis, making sure that we um, make those arrangements for families that may have that need, and particularly the graduates. Thank you so much, Dr. Cashwell, for interjecting that. I'm going to um, begin with uh, Ms. Shea. 
Uh, thank you, Chairman Cooper. Um, I do have a couple questions uh, around graduation. Um, if the first one uh, pertains to the photo op, um, if you could just explain a little bit to our families, is this going to be just um, just the students standing, you know, in front of a backdrop getting the photo taken, um, or will there be a presentation of the diploma with some school staff as well? Uh, I can speak to that a bit. Much of those arrangements are still being made. Um, each principal is working to uh, determine the logistics, but the idea would be that it's, it is ceremonious in nature. Each student would have an individual appointment. They may be accompanied by a limited number of, of family members, um, and then they would proceed into the location, whether it might be a common area or somewhere um, related to their stage where they would receive uh, their diploma in their cap and gown and be photographed with uh, their family, that, that select number that may have attended with them. Uh, they're working through how many uh, they can schedule a day with the photographers and that sort of things and what and that sort of thing and what the best backdrop and location will be at each school. Um, but the idea again would be it may be that um, based on social distancing protocols, they're not actually physically handed the diploma, but it might be in a location where they would pick it up on their own and pose with it for the picture. So some of those logistics are being worked out because we want to be keep not only our students and any guests they'd bring with them safe, but keep our staff who will be, and the photographers who will be working that event um, safe as well, but definitely want to capture that moment in a very special way um, and are, are so pleased to be able to actually provide the students not only an opportunity to arrive at their school, have that special moment, um, but to walk away knowing that they'll have that 8 by 10 and professional photograph as well. I appreciate that and the fact that um, it's a photo op, but it's not just a photo op, it's also ceremonious. It's almost like their own little personal graduation moment. Uh, and so I, I appreciate that. Um, another uh, question I had was around the graduation fees. And so each, I know um, senior class fees are higher than other class fees because of graduation. And um, I don't know if you know, what is um, what does what that $60 entail? Is it the cap and gown? Did some of it go to the Siegel Center? And if some of it went to the Siegel Center, um, what happened to those funds? Yeah, the, the funds that are collected at, it, at each site um, sort of go into the general pool of costs for graduation, which would include things like the Siegel Center and so on. And so obviously um, our costs are going to be different. There are some costs associated with the use of the raceway and some of these other um, pieces that you see outlined here. And so um, should the net cost of that be less than what was traditionally spent on graduation, we've um, already discussed looking to refund any difference that would have been uh, in the fee that was collected from students, but we're still working to determine the final costs. Thank you, Dr. Cashwell. And then my uh, last piece for graduation is just a comment that I really appreciate how um, you and your team took stakeholder feedback into account um, and were able to adjust the date of the victory lap. So as many of our um, families that had set that week aside and had, um, you know, grandparents, et cetera, um, will be able to participate in that. So um, thank you for making that adjustment um, and listening to our stakeholders. That, that and that's all I have. Thank you, Mrs. Shea. Ms. Ogborn? Uh, Ms. Shea covered all of my comments, so I'm good. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Kinsella? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Cooper. Um, Mrs. Shea covered most of my comments as well. I did want to um, thank everyone for adjusting, um, like Mrs. Shea said, adjusting the victory lap to accommodate um, the celebration part that was in a different week. Um, I can say I heard quite a bit of feedback here in the Brooklyn District about that, so I appreciate the responsiveness. Um, if you could please, Dr. Cashwell, explain the process so that folks understand um, the rationale why we did it th this way due to COVID and, um, and, and how decisions were made, if you would. 
Certainly. Um, you know, I don't think there's any mistaking the fact that we understand and share in the disappointment that a traditional graduation, as we've known it to be at the Siegel Center, wasn't possible. And certainly in our initial communications to our senior class and their families indicated that we'd hold those Siegel Center dates in hopes that we would get to a point where uh, we may be able to um, accommodate a graduation there in a different fashion or um, look for additional dates in a large arena. And um, as things have unfolded, clearly, even with um, guidelines and restrictions changing a bit, not seeing any change in the near future uh, that would allow for a gathering uh, to the scale of what we have with our graduates. So with almost 400 to 500 students in any graduating class, um, even the idea of having them alone in one space, not to mention staff, is just not possible given the current restrictions and even what we see on the horizon uh, through the summer. And so do believe that our graduates deserve to be celebrated um, at proximal to the time that they are officially ending their K-12 or whatever their length of experience with us was, they're, they're finishing out their senior year and did not want to leave them in limbo any longer than necessary. Heard from a number of seniors um, imminent to the closure about graduation and, and their desires and thoughts on what they'd like to see happen. And our school principals received that feedback directly, even unsolicited, you know, days after closing. Uh, it was very important to our seniors by and large, while everyone had different points of view as to what they might like to see in graduation celebrations. The um, overarching themes where they wanted something proximal to their graduation, uh, the traditional timing, knowing that many would be going off to jobs, the military, college, and that if we were to wait too long, it would uh, minimize opportunities uh, for, for most of, of students to participate. Uh, there were also, um, you know, a hot, there were uh, a number of comments and a common thread of how can we do something together? Really this desire for the senior class students to be together in some way. And obviously with restrictions being what they are, uh, we knew that while uh, a virtual ceremony would have some elements of together uh, in a digital fashion and we can, um, you know, maybe immediate families would be together, it still didn't get all of the graduating class into a similar space and time together. And so the raceway uh, provided a unique opportunity to meet that need. And so while the whole class and families can be together in an arena of sorts in their vehicles, um, that was a unique way to accomplish that uh, wish that our, our a majority of our seniors shared with us. And of course, capturing very various elements of uh, the ceremony was important to them and to us as well. And so we feel that we were able to take that general feedback and put it into a plan that um, best met that need and, and frankly provided our seniors um, the honors that they deserve in a manner that we understand is it can never replace what would have been uh, at the Siegel Center. But our, our high school principals and central staff uh, working to put together efforts for our, our seniors really took so many of those factors into account. And um, as was mentioned, try to be as responsive as, as possible as we can to our community, given the many uh, restrictions that are in place and uh, the various dates that various orders expire related to certain um, places has a lot to do with availability and those sorts of things. But um, I hope that speaks a bit to what you were asking. Yes, it does. I appreciate it. Um, our community members, based on the feedback I received, did not understand that there had actually been a as much communication, um, maybe not via a survey, but students had reached out, principals had been reaching out, and the team had really worked hard behind the scenes to come up with something that um, gave the students exactly um, honors they deserved, didn't expect, but in the same time frame as you mentioned, the week of graduation, um, and doesn't really provide the togetherness they had thought they would have. But it's it's an experience to which there was feedback gathered, and I think that was important for you to explain. So I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. That's all I have, Reverend Cooper. Thank you so much, Mrs. Kinsella. Uh, Ms. Atkins. Thank you, Chairman Cooper. I I echo Dr. Cashwell and Mrs. Kinsella's remarks. Um, and I also, I just want to publicly acknowledge that I know that this does not replace the traditional ceremony that many were anticipating and expecting. However, 
I am excited uh, about these activities that are coming forth for um, our future graduates. I think that we are going to make this grand. This is going to be something so very different, of course, and that we can do our best to make this memorable. And when I say we, I'm speaking of our, our school board, our administrative staff, and I'm talking about parents and families and friends. We can make this amazing. And it won't replace what was expected as a traditional ceremony, but what we can do is the very best that we can to make sure that we honor these students in the way that we should as safely as possible. And so I'm looking forward to the watch party. I will be decorating my home in anticipation of the watch party. I am going to put on my best outfit for this victory lap. And I will shout out to all these students when they go and take their cap and gown pictures to have the widest smile possible. Because even though the ceremony may not have been what you expected, what's most important is that you are graduating. And I just, I'm so proud of every last student. I'm so proud of every last family that supported the student that is graduating. And I can't wait for graduation week. I just can't. Pastor Cooper, the floor is back Thank to you. you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Agnes, I really appreciate that. Dr. Tigan? Absolutely. I'm going to talk about something that's amazing. I'm going to talk about Henrico Edflix. And I will talk about season three and stop, and then I'll finish up with season four. But I'll let you ask questions about season three, which is our, our um, what's happening during the summer. But the Division of Learning is currently working on the script for both Edflix season three and season four. Um, season three will begin on July 13th. And during this season, students will have an opportunity to participate in activities designed to provide closure for the current school year to include virtual orientations and tours for students transitioning from elementary to middle school and middle school to high school. This season is also intended to prepare all of our students for the start of the 2020-2021 school year with the with additional life-ready learning experiences. Students have access to the support, remediation, enrichment, and acceleration experiences they need to build skills on specific grade level content necessary for entry into the next school year. Students who typically would have engaged in summer academy or acceleration or exceptional education extended year programming will also have an opportunity to engage in experiences. There will be asynchronous and synchronous options for our students. Asynchronous is when learning is online or virtual learning with students that happens on student schedules. While the content and resources are provided by the teachers, students have the ability to access the content in a flexible time frame. Methods of asynchronous online learning include virtual pre-recorded lessons, and preloaded resources. On the other hand, there are synchronous learning opportunities that will be available this summer, and they're online or distance education that happens in real time delivered by a teacher at a specific time. Methods of synchronous online learning include video conferencing, teleconferencing, lab, live chatting, and live lessons. As we look at our pre-K students and early childhood special education students who do not receive extended school year services, they will have access to two pathways this summer. The first pathway will be at asynchronous teacher videos to support all pre-K students with kindergarten readiness skills and will run from July 13th through August 6th. Pathway two will run during that same time frame and there will be online resources and choice boards to support kindergarten readiness. With both pathways, teachers will be available during office hours to answer parent questions for two hours each day, Monday through Thursday, for that four week period. Virtual family meetings may be provided based on family requests. And as we move up to our elementary students, they will have a choice of three pathways 
and each will run for that same four-week period from July 13th to August 6th. Pathway one is synchronous, so it's teacher-directed virtual learning experiences that will support students in need of foundational literacy and numeracy skills delivered by teachers. Pathway two is asynchronous instruction where resources are pre that were previously recorded or loaded are embedded into a daily schedule to support students in need of foundational vocabulary development posted on Edflix. And pathway three will be another asynchronous instructional opportunity where there will be resources that were previously recorded or loaded embedded into a daily schedule to support foundational learning and enrichment for the upcoming grade level posted on Edflix. And teachers will be available during virtual office hours for three hours each day to answer parent questions, clarify content, and or provide feedback. As for our secondary students, they will have six pathways to participate in during the summer um, season three. Pathway one is asynchronous for students. The students will continue in the courses they are working on. Many of them will be missing maybe just one or two assignments to complete the course and get their verified credit. The students will be reaching out to, the teachers will be reaching out to students individually and facilitating the process of getting them through. The teachers will meet the students individuals needs. Very individualized process for pathway one. Pathway two is one of our traditional summer opportunities. It's the online health and PE. The virtual class um, meetings which are teacher directed will begin with health and once schools are accessible students will have an opportunity to, um, to the necessary equipment to be able to complete the PE portion of the course. Students enrolled in online health and PE will receive communication from their online teacher in the near future for this course begins on March 26th and runs through June 29th. Pathway three is online high school acceleration with virtual Virginia. This is another option that we have available each summer. These courses, Spanish one through four, French one through four, Latin one through three, geometry, US and Virginia history, English 12, government, earth science, and econ and personal finance will contain video segments, audio clips, whiteboard interactions, multimedia activities and online discussions, as well as a text. Um, instructors are available for telephone and online communication with students throughout the day, and course includes both asynchronous and synchronous components. And synchronous and asynchronous middle school remediation is our pathway four. It also includes high school acceleration and high school credit recovery. This is like our traditional summer academy offerings, but it will include online coursework, synchronous virtual instruction, and daily teacher office hours. Pathway five is online continued optional review and enrichment opportunities made available on Edflix through the start of the new academic year for secondary students. Will be, there will be on-demand experiences for students with access to secondary teachers during virtual office hours. And the last pathway is the for online economics and personal finance through Longwood University. And that will run June 15th through July 11th. The students will access online modules and lectures and be able to reach instructors via email. The WISE exam will be given remotely in a proctored online environment. This again is one of our normal summer offerings. When we look at our exceptional education supports that will be provided for students with a disability, there are two pathways that both run through from July 13th through August 6th. One pathway is for students who qualify for extended school year services, and the other pathway is for students who do not qualify for these services. So for pathway one, for students whose IEP teams have determined that they qualify for extended year um, services, they will have access to synchronous disability related services and support through virtual platforms as outlined in their individual education program. 
They may include teleservices for speech, OT, PT, or counseling, consultation with special education service providers, and direct instruction through virtual sessions with an exceptional education teacher. We are aware that there may be some students who require extended school year who are unable to access or benefit from virtual ESY services and the IEP teams will collaborate to determine the appropriate methods for providing these services once we are able to resume face-to-face -face interactions with students. For pathway two, for the students with a disability who do not qualify for the extended school year, they will have the same level of access to universal learning opportunities provided to all Henrico County Public School students. We will continue to port, support students both access to synchronous and asynchronous learning opportunities through audio versions of online text, closed captioning, and sign language interpretation as needed. Student support outlined as the student support as outlined in the temporary learning plans will be implemented. As for the communication plan, we intend to make sure that our administrators are well versed in season three starting tomorrow. We wanted to give the board an update today and then on Monday our teachers will hear all about season three and that on May 21st we will announce to our community um, and our most specifically, our parents and our students, what season three will look like. And I'll pause and answer any questions related to season three before we move on to season four. Thank you so much, Dr. Kygan. I know that that was a lot of information to digest. Is there anywhere that um, our constituents and families can see an update of a summary of what you just shared? Was there, is that, is that where, where would that be? I would just say that this is preliminary information we're sharing with our board first. We'll be working, and of course, um, I, I did provide a summary to the board in writing of some of this information, but you're right, it is a lot of information. And as it's communicated to our families beginning on May 21st, it'll certainly be outlined on our website and very clearly articulated um, from our school leaders as well. And again, um, season three relates to the summer programming. Thank you so much, Dr. Castro, for that, um, that kind of explanation. I appreciate that. We look forward to giving an update online. Um, we're going to start um, with Ms. Atkins. Thank you, Chairman Cooper. Dr. Teigen, thank you uh, for going over that information. That is a lot of information to digest uh, So, and uh, for you to share, of course. So thank you for that. I do want to put a couple things on the radar as we are talking about Edflix and sort of the dissemination of how we are going to continue to keep our students and families engaged. Uh, I'd like to recommend that we create tutorials around scheduling. Uh, this is very new for many families. And even though we've been in this virtual environment for a while, it's extremely difficult, me as a mom as well, as to trying to schedule. So I think it would be worth it to research uh, what it would take to create a tutorial around guiding our families on creating a schedule around Netflix, perhaps some templates or some guidance on how you can influence your day with Netflix or something of the sort. The other piece of that, uh, based off of what I heard and around scheduling the, the many options um, that families will have in how to contact their teachers. Uh, I'd like for us to, to really be proactive in providing the support to teachers to create schedules that are going to be consistent in, in giving guidance on how to use Edflix. I think uh, providing additional structure, foundational structures on, you know, may perhaps how um, teachers can have consistent schedules will help with structure for families in trying to use it, Flix. So all of this is leading to say, um, if we can just research or invest how we can create one tutorials that could be um, a part of the whole Edflix program on scheduling, you know, here are some best practices on how to incorporate Edflix in your day. And for our teachers, I just wanna make sure we're pre proactive in giving them the guidance that, that they may need on how to be consistent with scheduling and using Edflix. And so I am 
really happy to hear about the office hours. I, I would hope that those office hours, whatever hours those are that, that our teachers start with, that we do our best to stick with that. Uh, because when hours change, when Zoom meeting dates change, it really does impact, of course, the day for the family and, and may not have as much time to prepare in order to get the child ready and motivated for learning. So those are my comments. And Dr. Teigen, thank you so much for, for sharing and pro providing this presentation. Thank you. Chairman Cooper. Thank you. And, and Mrs. Atkins, if I might, to your point, I think which was excellent around scheduling, I think one of the differences that our families and students will notice going into season three, which is the summer, you know, what we um, are accustomed to now uh, was a steep and quick departure from face to face courses that immediately flipped to online. What's being designed for season three and for the summer is designed specifically to be virtual. So it's much clearer what the parameters and the schedules are going into it. And so, for example, when Dr. Teigen was talking about synchronous, that's when a student's enrolling in that option for summer, it's very clear that you log on at this time because you have to be there for the instruction that's occurring at that time. It's synchronous. It's happening at uh, the same time each and every day. Um, but certainly your point's well taken. And as we've designed the courses that are more self-paced and involve asynchronous opportunities and then those office hours, um, outlining <laughs> daily schedules is actually part of the work that the team has done in creating those courses going forward. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Cashwell. Yes, thank you, Dr. Cashwell, for clarity. Thank you so much, Ms. Atkins, for your comments and questions. Next, I'm going to reach out to Ms. Kinsella. Yes, thank you, Chair Cooper. Um, I do have a couple questions and a few recommendations as well to season three. Um, firstly, well, I guess I'll just tell my, say my two questions. Do we have the summer staff to accommodate all of our students that it would seem would be enrolled in season three? And secondly, what is the process for identifying which pathway our children need, uh, whether it's support, remediation, enrichment, or accelerated experiences? How will they be notified? Great, great questions. For the first one, um, we are just starting to look to hire, to put out and hire teachers for the summer. We don't anticipate having an issue being able to get teachers to do the work, um, who want to do the work and are the right people to do the work. So um, we've identified that we feel we need about 200 teachers to do this summer learning opportunities. And so that's one piece. Um, your second question, um, can you remind me what, I'm sorry, we'll just. It was related to, I, I'll, I'll take it. It's identifying which um, pathway student. may be the right yeah. pathway. And so certainly, you know, as was discussed, some of the um, pathways are designed to meet the traditional remedial part of summer school that has always been, or summer academy that most families are familiar with. Our students may uh, have been expecting already if they've not been on track on grade level or passing a course. And so um, our school administrators um, have a process for identifying identifying who those individuals are with their staff and would notify those families directly that that would be the appropriate pathway. Um, and, and then for the other pathways, uh, which may be, um, again, as we're outlined to address gaps or, or provide consistency um, and background information as kids are moving on to a, a sequential course, um, the schools will play a big role in communicating that information to students based on which of those scenarios they fall into. So as Dr. Teigen said, we begin communicating uh, this plan and what it looks like with our administrators over the next few days, and we'll work with them on determining how uh, they'll identify which students fall into which categories and how that we would then, of course, message that appropriately. Because... Um, for a parent to be able to navigate which of those pathways is, is the appropriate one would be a challenge. And, and we certainly recognize that. And it's an excellent question. And our, our teachers will have a big, play a big part in identifying the needs of each student. Right. Well, I'd, I'd like to thank you both for, for jumping in and, and answering those questions. Um, and then I would like to recommend and emphasize that when you're communicating with the students at the secondary level, because I would 
elementary, I would, you're definitely going to be communicating with the parents or the school or the teacher will be communicating with the parents. But I would just like to emphasize the need at the secondary level, whether it's middle school or high school, to include the parents in that communication. Speaking as a, a parent with kids all in secondary, I, some things have fallen um, by the wayside in my own household. And I consider myself to be well read on a lot of the things that that we've communicated. So if I could just emphasize the need for increased communication to include the parent and not just the students at the secondary level. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. That's it. That's it, Chair <clears throat> Cooper. Thank you so much, Mrs. Kinsella. Next, I would go to Mrs. Agra. Um, first of all, you know, um, I had a conversation with the parent a couple of days ago and essentially, you know, we forget that we did not have this in a, on a shelf waiting to be implemented, that this has come from a tremendous amount of work on our staff, the part of our staff and our teachers to put this together. You know, it seemed like, it seems like ages ago that we got this news that all of a sudden we were going to be closed and kids were going to be virtually learning. And to go from that to what we have now is amazing. But I want to thank the staff and Dr. Cashwell for listening to the needs of parents. We've gotten some feedback that, you know, parents are sitting at home, they're not used to being their child's teacher and having to do that, they're expressing what they need. And I, that's why I'm really glad to see the addition of our office hours, fa um, family meetings, things like that, a flexible schedule at times when it's um, possible, but the ability to meet the needs of all of our learners, wherever they are on the spectrum of, that's possible to, um, is essential because that's what our teachers do every day. And um, having enrichment, having all of this, and, and we've added so much content, a lot of videos of our teachers teaching, that kind of thing. I think as this has evolved, it is truly amazing. Um, the only thing I can hope when this is all said and done, and we look back on this time as a distant memory, that more people will appreciate what our educators do every single day because they're now doing it and they realize just um, how hard the life of a teacher is and, and, and administrators and educators in general. So hopefully we'll get a little more love for our teachers out there. But I would just really want to thank the staff, especially for adding the office hours, adding things that our parents are asking for. So that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Ogden. Last but certainly not least, Mrs. Shea. Thank you. Um, so when I look at all these paths being created, I mean, it's just, th there are so many. And so um, thank you to our, uh, particularly our central office staff that are developing all these plans concurrently and all of these layers at the same time. It, it truly is tremendous work. And while most of us will only experience one path or maybe two paths with our students um, to know that there are, gosh, upwards of 10 different plans being developed. Um, it, it really is tremendous. Um, my main question was around really the timing of things, which I think you answered starting May 21st, um, but I'll just officially uh, state for the record, um, the most of the communication about summer school um, and questions I have had have been from family, high school families who are used to the opportunities that we have through health and PE um, and our personal finance and they had been planning accordingly to take those this summer and so um, they are curious um, and ready to move forward with those. Um, and then I have a question that deviates a, a little bit from season three but it's kind of all tied up in what's to happen in the summer and we know that our students have items to be picked up from school um, and so um, do we have any idea, maybe I missed that in the COVID update, but first yeah. of all, do we have any idea when that might happen? And second of all, are we gonna require or at least strongly encourage that everyone going in the building wear a mask for those item retrievals? Um, we There is a plan, Dr. Grant has been working directly with the principals and the principals um, have been working with their staff uh, the last, the the two weeks in June, they have set up dates when teachers can come in 
Um, they are expected to wear masks and gloves when they're in the building uh, to retrieve their, their items. They're also going to package up the student supplies and be able to then deliver them on the bus loop. Much like we do grab and go meals, we're going to do grab and go um, school, you know, their supplies and so on. And that'll give an opportunity to have a little bit of closure. Again, maybe not exactly what we would want right now, but it's the most we can have with our students. And so those, those opportunities are being communicated with families directly through their schools as each one has their own time frame and plan for that. But it will be the first two weeks of June. Great. Some of the high schools start the end of the very end of May. Okay. I feel much more comfortable knowing that we're not going to have uh, a bunch of people, a bunch of students and families coming in the buildings and in close contact with each other. So thank you for that clarity. That's all I have for season three. Thank you so much, Mrs. Shea. Um, Dr. Togney, if you'd be so kind to proceed to season four, please. Absolutely. Given the unknowns around stay-at-home orders and social distancing requirements, what they will look like in September, preparation for season four will re also require the development of multiple learning mo models or options for the 2021 school year. So we currently have five options that we are starting to work on at this while they're finishing up season three, we're also starting to define um, season four. Option A would be on-campus learning. The, the learning occurs with all students back on campus with adjusted pacing to address the miscontent during the spring of 2020 with safety measures in place. Option B would be remote learning. All students will participate in remote learning experiences. You know, where we are right now would be option B. Option C is for interrupted on-campus learning. The learning occurs with all students back on campus for several weeks or months at a time, interrupted by periods of remote learning um, with safety protocols in place. Then there's also an option D, which is the hybrid model, where some students learn on campus while others learn remotely, potentially alternating days and building a blended learning environment in order to stay within social distancing guidelines. And option E, we're calling the parallel pathway, and some students will be learning on campus while others are learning remotely because of choice or necessity without alternating days as students are learning consistently within either the school environment or the online environment. It's important to note that this last option, the parallel pathway, provides families who may be hesitant to send their students back to school for any reason with an option to remain a Henrico County Public School student, an actual online student. And as these potential learning models are mapped out, a wide variety of considerations and implications related to infrastructure, access, teaching and learning, operations, and social emotional learning will be taken into account. Principals, teachers, parents, and students will be a part of this planning process. And I look forward to providing an update at our next board meeting. And so I that will be the end of my presentation. I will answer questions, but I'd like to say thank you for giving me this opportunity at each meeting to brag about the amazing things our staff is doing each and every day. It has been a true team effort. Thank you again, Dr. Um, Tigan. Um, Ms. Shea. Thank you, Dr. Tigan. I have a question about a couple of our different models and I'll just go in alphabetical order. Okay. So start as a, as a true teacher, alphabetical order. So um, if we start with option A, you mentioned um, that um, it would be on campus learning, but with adjusted pacing and often off, also safety measures. Can you explain what some of those safety measures being considered are? We are looking to follow whatever safety protocols that the Virginia Department of Health, the C which will come from the CDC or from the Virginia Department of Education. We know that may require, um, it, it may go from, you know, requiring temperature checks to um, making sure that we have students in classrooms, um, we change how we do business, even though we're face-to-face. -face. 
So like maybe in, a, in an elementary school, it may require our um, resource teachers to go into classrooms rather than moving kids through the hallways time and time again. So there could be some protocols that are there. It could be when they're in the hallways that they're remaining six feet apart. And so we would make sure, you know, we've discussed whether we need to mark the floors in schools to kind of show what um, social distancing looks like um, physically within the building. And so those are the things that we would want to take into account. But again, we would be relying on what the CDC, Virginia Department of Health and Virginia Department of Education was sharing with us that we need to be um, doing to make sure that our, our students and our staff are safe. Uh, as a high school teacher, it's hard for me to imagine what class changes would look like with everyone uh, six feet apart uh, at our secondary level, but but I'm sure this uh, VDOE and CDOC will give us some good guidelines um, as a as a starting place, um, I would also like to suggest um, to me what's kind of a, a an easy common sense safety measure of increased hand washing um, required at all of our levels um, and abilities to do that. Um, that's good any any year, but particularly this year. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, fast forwarding to option D, um, which would be the hybrid option. Um, you mentioned alternating days, um, and I want to mention um, if we go with an alternating day model, we need to give great consideration for family schedules um, and trying to have um, all students in the same family, if possible, on the same day. Um, because you, a lot of our families in terms of working and childcare, um, it's going to be really hard if their kids are on opposite days. And so I know that's a logistical hurdle, but um, it certainly needs to be considered. As well as with alternating days, consideration for our teachers not to be working double, you know, working with half their classes in the in the classroom while trying to juggle half their class virtual and then swap. Um, a teacher can't be delivering in-person lessons and virtual lessons at the same time. And we also don't want them doing double time planning. And so um, really thinking about our staff um, in that context um, or uh, also considering, um, you know, if we end up, you know, spreading out students or spreading out um, how that um, the extra staff that would be needed there um, where to, how to cost, cover that cost in a budget shortfall, and also, frankly, where to find staff if we were to do that um, are all considerations um, to be taken. And then lastly, for um, option E, the, uh, the parallel model. Um, so I, I think this is really important. I have seen this coming up in a lot of my mom circles of families that, frankly, um, for whatever, for health reasons or, or choice reasons or other reasons are not ready to send their kids um, back to school in the fall. And we don't wanna lose them as Henrico students. And we wanna be able to, as Henrico, provide supports for them. So I think this is a really important option. I'm interested, particularly for our elementary schools and our smaller elementary schools, if, we, if there's a significant number of students who decide to enroll in the hybrid option, could that possibly affect the complements that have been designated to those schools? Um, and, and how or when might we know that? The question, the the easy answer is yes, it may, but I do think that we, we've discussed the need to be able to gather feedback from our parents as to what their will is with regard to participating in a full online um, program for next year, and then being able to adjust staffing accordingly. So there may be you know, one teacher per grade level from a school that's teaching the online, or it may be one teacher for every two elementary schools or three, or there could be one for a high school content, depending on you know, the level of enrollment, or there might be one per school that is teaching the online option. But it's gathering feedback from our families because we have to know the numbers we're planning for and what schools they're coming from, and that will allow us to adjust complement prior to the start of the school year. So I would say that that would be, um, no later than an August type um, surveying of parents to see what their options are. It could be earlier than that, 
Um, but I know that we need time to be able to adjust and be able to identify the teachers who want to teach online and are um, able to do that. Yeah, I think that would be a, a sooner is better, sooner rather than later um, in terms of surveying interest from our families, not necessarily requiring that they commit to it, but just um, like you said, gauging interest so that we know um, where there is interest, how much interest is there, what parts of the county, where we'll have to make shifts um, and plan accordingly. So even if we don't know exactly what um, is going to happen inside of our buildings yet, at least gauging some preliminary interest in our families on who might be um, interested in the virtual side of the parallel model. That is all I have. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Shea. Ms. Ogburn. Um, I'll just uh, echo a, a little bit of what Marcy said, but I really appreciate the fact that we are looking at this now and considering that none of us have a crystal ball, knowing that we have been exploring all the options that are before us. Um, I am honestly concerned about the budget impact that this is going to have um, in the fall, as like Marcy said, with staffing. And I think that's a real concern for us to be looking at and figuring out what our options are going to be. In that regard, we may have to be even more creative than we've ever been. But um, I just appreciate the fact that we're going to be involving the, the students and the families in this discussion. Um, I think it would be a good idea that this list and I, um, that we're looking at all the options and as we add to them be made public because it's not in our presentation today, but we have that somewhere so that families that aren't listening today will have it. Um, so that they know what we're thinking about, whether we put this as part of our COVID update on the website um, or somewhere so that people know what we're talking about. And as we go forward, they can say, well, I've never heard of that before. So I just think we need to, to get it out there, the things we're considering. And I'm sure it's going to change as the months go on. But um, that's my only input. Thank you. And just Thank so you me. know, Mr. Jenks was planning on um, adding a little bit of information about season four so that our families would be aware when season three is being communicated next okay, week great. on the 21st. But you can certainly expect as a, as a board that we'll bring more information forward related to those um, options A through E uh, as we think about the new school term or season four as well um, at the next board meeting as we continue to flesh out some of the impacts related to cost and so forth and, and what our plan will be for engaging um, our community and our staff, frankly. As you said, there are lots of factors to consider with teacher preference and um, staff preference as well as family preference. So we'll we'll be getting into that um, soon. Thank you, Dr. Castro, for that interjection. Uh, Ms. Kinsella. Yes, thank you, Chair Cooper. Um, thank you, Mrs. Shea and Mrs. Ogburn, because you covered a lot. Um, and I, I appreciate how hard staff is working. I mean, the team has not rested since before we got out of school. Uh, well, we closed our buildings on March 13th, so thank you. Um, I just have a concern as to how soon we will identify which students and staff feel comfortable coming back in our buildings. When will that survey take place? You know, we are hoping that soon we're going to have some guidance related to what safety protocols might be required or be in place. It, it, it's it's a bit premature to ask questions related to preferences because I think a lot of family and staff decisions will be based on what, uh, whether schools will be uh, allowed to reopen and if they are, then what protocols would be required. And so, um, you know, we're certainly not going to wait and wait and in absence of an answer, find preferences. But we're hoping to, as some of these first governor's orders are expiring, so June 10th is the, the expiration of one, that we'll have a better idea of what the intent is related to larger group gatherings, schools, and um, get some guidance on what it might look like and then begin to uh, ask questions from there. We can certainly work with our staff now on understanding where their capacity is, virtual versus face-to-face, -face, building that capacity as Mrs. Atkins brought up and then finding out 
where what their preferences might be. Um, but certainly it's going to be fine tuning what our family and student needs are all through the summer. Um, you know, the addition of the virtual registration process in the coming uh, weeks will allow us to have a better pulse on how many students are coming new into the system, but it's going to then be nuancing those we've already got and those that are coming in new where they might fit on this continuum of, of needs. Thank you. I know I've heard if I could share um, yeah. of, a, of a group of enrollment that outside of our kindergarten enrollment is due to circumstance or relocation um, mm -hmm. that we may be getting some of our students back from the private school. So I think that's a consideration for us to keep in mind um, no matter which scenario we look at in terms yeah. of in terms of staffing. But I would just I'm, I'm pleased that we're going to reach out to our teachers sooner than later and given the alternative, given them choices, no matter where we are in this social distancing. I think um, getting ahead on that is important for us to figure out where we go. Thank you, Reverend Cooper. That's all I have. Thank you so much, Ms. Kinsella. Uh, last but certainly not least, Ms. Atkins. Thank you, Chairman Cooper. Um, what a magnificent um, discussion when you can have a, a variety of options to research, investigate, and then get feedback from the community. You know, when we are considering a path to reopen, you know, we have to ask ourselves, you know, when to reopen, for whom, and, you know, sort of with what health and safety precautions in place that are affordable and sustainable um, with our budget. And um, I just want to say out to those that are watching, this is tough um, and making decisions based on, you know, the limited and certainly rapidly changing epidemiological evidence that is out there, you know, it, it, this is tough. Uh, the good news is that we do know that uh, some of these questions will be answered because we can't answer them. They will be answered by the governor. They will be uh, answered by the Virginia Department of Education. And some of, of our questions will be answered by the community. And we want to listen to, um, you know, the opinions and thoughts of the community uh, as we move forward in trying to figure out what options are best. I do want to share through several communication uh, mediums that I've been using in the public what I am hearing. And the number one, I'll give you the number one and I'll give you the number two. The number one has been safety first. Um, and regardless of what decisions that we make, whether we're talking about, which we'll be talking about shortly, the calendar or reopening schools, the number one uh, feedback that, that I receive almost daily now is making sure that we look at safety first. And some of the questions that, I, that I'm gonna share um, with my colleagues and, and Dr. Cashwell as well, I'll just read these three because they continuously come up and I think it's something that, that we need to have more conversation on. And so um, are the custodians and other professionals like bus drivers, nutritional workers, et cetera, able to accommodate the heightened health and sanitation protocols. So when we're considering some of these options, you know, um, in, you know, having kids go back into the buildings and our, our health professionals, like our nurses in the building, are they going to be adequate with the appropriate equipment that they're going to need? Are custodians going to have the resources that they need uh, to keep the buildings clean? Because certainly um, they will be doing so much more than what they have done in the past giving the requirements that are going to be necessary in order to have our, our building buildings open. The other uh, question that I have received is around nutrition. Um, are there going to be a, a special way that the food will be inspected that are that the children will receive? Uh, I think it's a valid question. Are, are any protocols going to be changed? That's something that we wouldn't determine, of course, that will be we receive guidance on how food is, is entered into the building and how it's disseminated uh, as well. And then another question is really around the physical infrastructure of our buildings. Uh, you know, normally your child gets on the bus, they get off the bus, they go through the front door. Uh, again, that's another question I received. What is that going to look like for transportation if we decide to have some days where kids go to school, so they don't go to school, how does that impact our transportation department and the partnership uh, between the schools? So I just wanted to give that feedback because that's feedback that I'm getting that may be helpful in, in our discussion and decision-making. 
Uh, Dr. Tygen, I do have a, a question around um, with the options that, that are available that we will be considering is around our, our special programs like Gifted and ACA. Has J. Sergeant Reynolds provided any insight or input into their thoughts around these options and, and how they would work with our students in, these, in this type of, of environment with any of them? I just want to know if, if our partners like J. Sergeant Reynolds and ACA have given any guidance or thoughts. Um, as far as J. Sergeant Reynolds, they're, as a community college system, they are working together across the state to um, look at options for moving forward. I do know there's been conversation about making sure that all coursework, whether it's through the ACA dual enrollment classes or the CTE dual enrollment classes, that um, all of the coursework will be, in, will be in the learning management system. So for us, that's in Schoology. Um, for JSARGE, they use Canvas, but um, they just came out today and said it's fine if we use our um, learning management system, but to be able to monitor and know where students are, as well as to be able to continue instruction. So they're, they're putting protocols in place so that they're prepared as well, whether um, it's going back face to face, whether it's um, starting back and not being able to, to stay back in school or whether they remain um, using only an online protocol for the fall. So we haven't heard any definitive decisions from, our, um, from J. Sergeant Reynolds or any of the other community colleges, but we know they are talking about options as well. And um, when they come to those decisions as a collective group, based on, I'm sure, the same input we're looking for from the, um, you know, our, the Center for Disease Control, as well as from the governor's office, that they'll communicate that with us as well and, and we'll adjust. So, you know, that, that's been a constant conversation between us and Jay Sarge throughout this process, even having our students finish up that were enrolled this year. Thank you, Dr. Tigan, for that. I think it's important that we also make sure that we keep the conversation about some of our other programs on the table. Um, and so while those might be a smaller population or pocket uh, of students, I'd like for us to continue in our communications to make sure that we also highlight what we're doing um, in, in our special programs as well. So that, that's just a recommendation to make sure that in our communications, we somehow address that we are looking at things like ACA and CTE as well as sort of that standard um, curriculum and instruction. And that's all I have back to you, Chairman Cooper. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Atkins and Dr. Tigan. Dr. Tigan, do you have anything else you wanna add on the COVID-19 update? No, sir. Thank you so much for, for your hard work, your dedication, and commitment. Um, Madam Superintendent, can you proceed with the review of our budget, our calendar, please? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. And uh, segueing into the next item, which is related to proposed calendars, um, it's important to note, not for the 2020 fall year we were just discussing uh, in season four, but for the 2021-2022 school year. Uh, you may recall, uh, board members, that just prior to our closure uh, for COVID, uh, Dr. Tigan presented to you two calendar options, one being a traditional school year start and one being a pre-Labor Day start that surfaced from the calendar committee uh, that had been working on this endeavor. And then, of course, we also presented our intent to um, gather a good bit of community input and feedback related to that um, uh, pre-Labor Day start. And so given the, the current situation that we're in, um, I retracted that um, initial proposal. And so instead, um, administration wanted to put forward uh, the traditional calendar, uh, given some of the challenges and getting a good bit of community discussion and input around anything that would be a departure from our traditional calendar, um, specifically a pre-Labor Day start. Um, so that uh, is what we are prepared to discuss uh, with you this afternoon, but also in response to some excellent uh, board member questions, 
given the circumstances related to COVID, um, the desire to look at alternative calendars that may help us to better meet the needs of our students given the impacts of COVID. A request was made to look uh, once again at that pre-Labor Day start calendar, as well as what an extended year calendar might look like. And since our committee had developed all of those scenarios as potentials, um, they've been shared uh, with the board uh, in preparation for this meeting. And so I'll turn it over to Dr. Teigen to take us through a discussion of those. Dr. Teigen? Absolutely. And if I can take a, um, a little liberty here to, to take a sidestep to the um, to next year's calendar just while before we get into the following year's calendar. Um, I wanted to share just a slight modification to next year's calendar with November 3rd is currently that is election day and it is currently slated for a half day of professional learning and a half day of clerical work. And as we talk about professional learning, it's not always sitting in a you know, in front of a presenter working, there are other ways, but we want to be very clear on election day that um, staff does not need to be in schools. And so we would like, we're just going to change that day to make sure that it's, it, it's indicated as a full clerical day on our 2020-2021 calendar. And so with that said, and um, the introduction with Dr. Cashwell, I uh, will move on with the presentation. So on the afternoon of March 12th, I stood before you to share two versions of the 2021-22 school calendar, a pre-Labor Day and a post-Labor Day option. I had worked collaboratively with the Chief of Communications and Community Engagement to develop a plan that provided multiple opportunities for our staff, families, and community to engage in the conversation about a pre-Labor Day start. There were morning, afternoon, and evening events planned across the county. That evening, Henrico County Schools no notified our staff and families that we would be shut down for two weeks, beginning on Monday, March 16th. That very day, Governor Northam ordered all Virginia K-12 schools closed for at least two weeks. Then just a little over a week later, on March 23rd, the governor announced an extended school closure of K-12 th schools through the end of the year. At this point, we knew we would no longer be able to engage staff and community in discussions around a pre-Labor Day start. As schools and families grappled with the closing of schools and daycares, the calendar for 2021-2022 was not pressing. Detailing the consequences of a par pandemic were paramount. Um, However, school and families are now planning for the summer of 2021-2022, pushing plans from this summer to next summer. Given the unknowns for the upcoming school year and the impact that may have on the following school year, staff is sharing the three options for the 2021-2022 school year that resulted from the work of the calendar committee. The first two were shared at the May 12th school board meeting. Um, that's the pre-Labor Day and post-Labor Day. Given the uncertainties of closures moving forward and the subsequent need for closing learning gaps, an extended year calendar is also being shared as a third option. This was an option originally brought forward from the calendar committee in the fall. Um, it was dismissed at a, as a possibility at that time to the opening of two new schools in the 2021-2022 school years. That's actually three schools if you include include the um, addition onto holiday. Given the current conditions and with the potential of future school closures leading to even greater learning gaps, we just wanted the board to have an opportunity to, to look at all the options that are available. Um, and I would be remiss if I did not share that staff does feel adequately that we can adequately address learning gaps with any of the three calendar options. So for the first one is the pre-Labor Day version is shown here. I know it's more easily seen online and it's listed as version A. Staff would report to work on Monday, August oh, on um, Hold on, I've got to make sure. I've got something. Give me just one second. Um, staff would report on Monday. This is the pre-Labor Day. 
Um, okay, I'm sorry. I'm just I confused myself in the order of these. Staff would report I, for teaching. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but is there any way to make this larger? Um, I know you um, might be able to, and but it is very hard to see. I believe what we are seeing is different than what the public is seeing, and and that's the full screen version. Uh, what we are right. seeing is much smaller, and unfortunately, I don't know that there's a way in this view to make it larger. Okay, uh, All right. Sorry. It, it, it may be something you could pull up in board docs on um, on okay. your screen instead. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. So this is the pre-Labor Day version, and staff would report to work for Teacher Work Week on Monday, August 16th. Students would report to school on Monday, August 23rd, and the last day of school would be Friday, June 3rd. The student holidays for that year would include September 3rd and 6th for the Labor Day weekend as required by Virginia state law. In addition, there would be, and, and I will tell you, these holidays are consistent now from here. I'll tell you when we stop, but they are consistent for all calendar versions. September 16th would be a student holiday in observance of Yom Kippur, October 11th for Columbus Day, November 2nd for Election Day, November 4th for Diwali, November 24th through 26th for Thanksgiving, December 20th through the 31st for Christmas and winter break, April 4th through 8th for spring break, April 18th for Easter, May 3rd for Idel Fetra, and May 30th for Memorial Day. The calendar would include three anytime, anywhere learning days that we now know we can do quite well and bring the total number of student days to 180. The post Labor Day version that's shown here and is known as version B, the teachers would report for teacher work week on Monday, August 31st. Students would report to school on Wednesday, September 8th as September 7th is Rosh Hashanah. The last day for students would be Friday, June 17th. Again, the student holidays would be the same, and there are three anytime, anywhere learning days to bring the total number of days to 180. In the third version, the extended year version is version C. Staff would report for teacher work week on Monday, July 19th. Students would um, report to school the following Monday, July 26th. And the last day for students would be Friday, June 17th. What is different about this calendar is that it includes intercessions. And these intercessions provide the ability to close achievement gaps throughout the year while simultaneously reducing the summer slide. The summer break would be four weeks long. The intercession periods are shown in orange and are September 27th through October 8th, June 3rd through the 14th, thereby it's tied to the winter break, and March 21st through April 1st being tied to spring break. Um, if we pursue, um, the student, would, the student calendar would include five anytime, anywhere learning days to bring the total number of days to 180. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I will say that while these three um, calendars are very different versions of the same basic um, components, I know there's limited opportunity to gather feedback from our staff and families before we would adopt a version on May 28th. Um, and so I know that that staff still recommends the post Labor Day start as um, would be the preference. But as always, happy to hear questions and feedback from from the board. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Tigan. Uh, let me begin with uh, Mrs. Shea. 
Thank you so much. And um, I have quite a few questions that are calendar uh, and comments that are calendar related. So I appreciate your patience with me. Um, my first is a request. Um, I know we have a shorter window for um, community input, but I would really like a survey to go out to our families. I think it is imperative that we have public input, um, especially on this issue and especially during this time. Um, over the last eight weeks, we have uh, received numerous requests from constituents to consider additional calendar options, which um, is what we're doing. I've also noticed a lot of the conversation around calendar preferences um, shifting pre-COVID versus post-COVID. And speaking with some board members in um, neighboring districts, they've noticed the same thing too. So I think now, um, even more than any other year, um, it's absolutely imperative that we gain um, stakeholder feedback. And so even if that window um, is shorter and not optimal, I would really love for the team to put together some sort of survey to go out to our stakeholders next week. Absolutely. Um, and then next I have a handful of questions, um, mostly centered around the extended calendar, the extended year calendar. You know, I have to admit, um, as a mom of young children, frankly, that calendar would work very well for my family. And as a teacher, what I specifically taught in my specific classes, that calendar would work really well. Um, but I know that my experiences are not necessarily indicative of all of our stakeholders, um, which is why I think it's imperative to have that survey, as well as I know that a radical shift like the extended year calendar often has a lot of unintended consequences. And so a lot of my um, questions go through kind of trying to pick through some of those layers and have a complete understanding. Um, so the first one is, are there any budgetary considerations uh, that need to be made for an extended year calendar? Um, I, the one additional cost would come from teacher stipends for acceleration, remediation, enrichments during those intercessions. Um, research that was done by Jay Lark with a it was actually a report to the governor and General Assembly of Virginia back in 2011 said that the cost for um, staffing those intercessions and providing those services to students could run between one to nine percent of the total um, per pupil expenditure. Um, we do know these costs could be mitigated by securing a year-round grant through the VDOE. There is a $50,000 planning year grant as well as um, a subsequent grant that could, you, schools can request up to $300,000 per school for a total of three years. I will say that I do know that we cannot access summer school funding for those intercessions, um, even though the intercessions might replace some of the um, need for summer school a significant amount of need for summer school. Um, so that would be the only cost I can think that that I know of from the research I've read. Um, Ms. Or Dr. Tigan, when you talk about staffing for intercessions, would any of those intercessions be required for our students or would they be optional much the way that uh, summer school would be? They would be optional, but I would think you know, students who are struggling academically would be encouraged through personal contact, just like we do for summer session okay. from the administrator and teachers. Um, next, uh, what educational evidence supports the move to an extended year calendar to fill gaps from uh, this year? Um, seen as actually the number of face-to-face -face days uh, is a few less than a traditional calendar. Um, the academic case for an extended school year stems from studies that show that the achievement gap between low-income students and their higher-income peers is exacerbated during the extended time between the end of the one school year and the start of the next. That summer slide, um, that comes from the same JLARC study. Year-round schedules can enrich students' educational experiences for allowing for the addition of intercessions and even the creative courses that it allows. Some argue that offering more regular breaks also prevents um, both teacher and student burnout from school. So they're more energized when they when they are in school. 
Um, next, uh, for our youngest learners and our exceptional education learners who may need more time to, tradition, to transition into and out of new routines as there are more breaks, um, I have concern that this may lead to lost time um, due to more upheaval in routine. Is there any data from schools currently used using this model on those considerations? I have not, um, was not able to find any information. I specifically looked for that in the research. Um, but one of the things is that connecting some of the intersections, two of the three, to existing breaks, you already have that break in time that kids are in school. Yes, it's extended, but it's not an additional time. Um, in hopes of maybe minimizing that, but there is no research on that. that so I really have. we're looking at one additional break is what you're saying? Correct, the okay. fall break. Um, my next question is, is specifically pertains to high school. I think a lot of the examples we see of year round and extended year school are in elementary school. Um, but for high school students, extracurriculars play a huge part in the school experience, as well as their social emotional health. Um, I have uh, some concern and some interest about how sports would look when other VHSL counties are not on the same schedule. Um, and if athletes are playing through the breaks that they then essentially would be involved year round in school and not um, receiving any breaks. Also activities like marching band that depend on the weeks before school starts. Would this happen in July? Would this not happen? Would it be able to happen before or after school in August? Any ideas on what those would look like? Fall, fall athletes usually begin practice in early August right now, um, and the same is true for marching bands. So those practices um, would probably line up better because they would line up with the school year rather than having to occur in the summer month. Um, I would not anticipate moving them back to July. They would be aligned to the school day. Um, and that also helps with students who want to participate in band or athletics who might not have transportation because if they have transportation to school, they will be there for, be able to be there for the practices. Um, and I will tell you our athletes currently play through breaks as there are tournaments that go on during winter break, during spring break. Um, and so that is, that's already a part of their life as an athlete. Thank you, Dr. Tigan. Um, also, what other localities are considering this plan? So many childcare options and activities depend on a regional approach to fill needs, as well as a lot of our teachers and staff live in districts outside of Henrico and having a vastly different schedule could provide a lot of challenges for these families. Right, currently Chesterfield has Bellwood Elementary School that's in its second year of being an ex an, on an extended school calendar. Fallen Creek Elementary School will be an extended year next year, and their intent is the fo you know is the following year to bring on the middle school, so it's within a feeder pattern. Um, Hopewell has um, planned for an extended school year. They will be going division wide um, extended school year for the 2020-2021 school year. And I know that Rich, Richmond is, you know, recently said that they are um, looking at this option as well for next year. Thank you. Um, that's the end of my questions. Just a few comments. You know, this is a, would be a severe departure from what is typical in our area. And if this seems like the option that um, most of the board um, would like to pursue, um, the scientist in me needs to see some data um, and the pros and cons from school systems that have already implemented this calendar, especially for our most at risk learners um, and also for high school students, since a lot of the examples we see for this are elementary school. You know, Henrico trailblazes for a lot of things, which I love, but I feel strongly that a major shift like this needs to have regional buy in. Um, and right now, I, I don't know that we have enough regional players um, to make that happen. So I am eager to hear from other board members on their position, as well as I look forward to the input of the community. Um, just in our um, 
just in the feedback that we've gotten for this meeting from the public, you can see that there's a, a wide variety of opinions. Um, and so that survey is just imperative. Thank you everyone for your patience on all my many questions and I yield the floor. Uh, May, and Mrs. Shea, if I might interject, uh, I think while you, uh, we've directly answered or Dr. Teigen directly answered the questions you posed, would just want to reiterate uh, both to the board and, and to the public as, as, um, as was discussed at the intro of the presentation that certainly uh, administration's recommendation for the board's consideration is draft B. And that's the one that is the traditional start. And that is related to a number of circumstances, including the ability to fully move our community along appropriately in a discussion. I think surveying is critically important, but recognizing that beyond simply asking people's opinion comes some opportunity to educate them on what the options really mean. And um, given the circumstances is I understand that both A and C are departures that are fairly significant from what has been expected. Um, and while both may have merit uh, for discussion, and I certainly appreciate the board's uh, desire to discuss those given the circumstances at hand, would just again want to anchor the discussion and the administration's recommend recommendation being for the board's consideration of B. Uh, however, if to consider uh, B seriously, that means uh, collecting some survey data related related to A and C, then, um, you know, certainly we defer to the board on that and, and look forward to hearing the thoughts of others. Thank you so much, Dr. Cashwell, for your point of clarity. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Shea, for your comments. Let me just say for a point of context that we are reviewing the proposed 2021-2022 school calendar options, um, but approval will be requested um, at the May 28th meeting. So we're not approving it today, but we're sharing it um, for information purposes as well as for dialogue in regards to it. So that being said, I'm going to move from Ms. Shea and now go to Ms. Agra. Mrs. Ogburn, you're muted. I'm sorry. Thank you, I'll start again. I just wanted to thank Ms. Shea for um, all of the, the discussion points that she brought up because there, there are those and many more because um, she's right. We have already begun to hear from members of the public. I got a call from a teacher yesterday um, saying that, you know, I, you gave me your number a long time ago and I hope it's okay I, I use it, which of course it is. But um, I know our teachers are concerned about this, as is the public. And I, I would echo uh, Marcy's call for a survey, um, but I would also um, like to see us form, I hate to say it, but form a committee in addition, sort of an expanded calendar committee to look at the possibilities of what other school districts are doing, possibly piloting a uh, year like Chesterfield has done choose one of our schools to pilot this to see how it works for us. Because I think Marcy's right. Um, the regional concerns pop up for me um, first. For example, I'm uh, chairman of the board at Maggie Walker. And so we have Maggie Walker, we have Code RVA, we have other regional programs that I think would be drastically affected. And the regional concern, I think, will will come out real quickly um, from a survey. Um, I think we would also, as Marcy pointed out, we have people who live in one county, work in another. We're going to have those issues. But um, I personally am thinking that right now there are so many things that people have to worry about. And it's such a time of upheaval that, you know, next year, in September, we start post Labor Day as we had planned, and then see how next year develops. Have the calendar committee do with maybe an expanded calendar committee do the research, gather that data that Marcy is talking about, slice and dice a um, survey that we've done, and then we go forward. Um, I, I just think that the staff recommendation is a good one, and um, but I do think that the it's an ongoing discussion because we are the leaders. We are people who do things in a revolutionary way, but the core of it has to be able to meet the needs of our students. And 
the needs of our students are year round. So we do have to, if it's not a year round school option, maybe find an option that is somewhere in the middle where we meet the needs of students who need the help over the summer months. But with that, I'll just yield to someone else. But um, I think we do have to get that regional perspective and maybe some more information from the calendar committee. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Ogburn, for your insight as well. Um, next, Ms. Kinsella. Yes, thank you, Chair Cooper. Um, I'd like to thank Marcy and Mickey for such substantial um, insights and, and questions about the calendar. I can tell you I heard from quite a few constituents in the short window of time, um, in addition to some that I heard from back in March when we first discussed it um, prior to schools, um, our, prior to our buildings being closed. Um, I agree with you, Mickey. Calendar decisions are typically aligned with regional as a part of regional conversations. Um, I'm not opposed to a potential pilot conversation, but at this point, I think extended year school is not what our community members need. It's not what our teachers need. It's not what our parents need. I think that right now we have too much stress, um, and then. It, when we do start school, hopefully in fall 2021, um, it won't be like fall like this year. So I'd like to eliminate whatever stress we can from our families. Um, and I agree about feedback because that's one of the things that actually um, was was filling up my voicemail and inbox in terms of how can we have three such drastic options and why is there such a, a rush to vote? Um, or the, the board to potentially vote on May 28th. So if someone could please answer that question as to why um, it's being recommended we vote May 28th. I can yes. certainly speak to that. And again, while um, my recommendation is option B, as I stated, and that's what I'm seeking your vote on. However, board member questions leading up to this presentation were to include some other options, which uh, included a look at a year-round calendar as well as to reintroduce the pre-Labor Day calendar that we introduced back in March. And so that's why they were included for purposes of this discussion. And certainly if the will of the board is to, to postpone that vote and not move forward um, at that time, we certainly can do that. It, um, we committed to our community long ago in approving calendars that we would make decisions related to the start of the 21 school year in this time frame so that they could make plans. Uh, the last time we entered in a community conversation about this, um, and I know both Dr. Tygen and Mr. Jenks can fill in some of the blanks related to the timeline, because we have talked about a pre-Labor Day start before with our community, and feedback was, you know, important that they knew long in advance based on Labor Day vacation plans and home rentals and all of these things that we make calendar decisions far enough in advance that they have that notice. So this was the window of time that had originally been communicated to to our community in regards to making a decision far enough in advance for them to understand uh, what the start of the 21 school year would look like. However, again, yield to the board's will if, if um, there's a desire to um, take a vote at a different time. But that's why it, it, it shows up in this time frame based on ongoing conversations related to timelines for approving the calendar. Do, do fellow board members feel as though May 28th is reasonable? if we can get um, community feedback from a survey. And I assume if I might ask a clarifying question, if, if, if we're surveying the public related to A and C along with B, then it's the boards considering the potential of implementing A, B, or C um, seriously, then, you know, I would suggest that that we look at extending that time frame, um, particularly because it sounds like there are a number of questions, uh, even from board members related to those options. Well, then should we eliminate potentially the option C today, and then maybe just evaluating A and B? Reverend Cooper, um could I comment on that? Yes, ma'am, Ms. Ogborn, please be my guest. <laughs> well, I actually would like to get an opportunity to speak before we start talking about different decisions that we want to make moving forward. Uh, okay, I'll yield to Ms. Atkins. To Go right ahead. Uh, 
Thank you, Mrs. Auburn. Um, I just wanted to chime in a little bit, and, and I, number one, support um, Mrs. Shea in having a survey to find out what families want. I think that's the first step in making such a, a big decision like this that could impact uh, locally and regionally. And therefore, uh, one, we need family feedback for this. And just on that point alone, we want to give families the opportunity to complete a survey. I think if if we are serious about getting information from the public, then we want to also give them the opportunity to complete the survey. And I think that takes longer than a week. And so number one, I do think we should uh, move the date for providing a decision back just based on making sure that we can one, offer time for folks to complete the survey, but then we need time to analyze the survey and we need time to digest the survey as leaders to make sure that we are making the best decision possible. So those are my two thoughts on that. Um, and then as far as I'll go ahead and, and answer your, your question, Christy, around option C and extended day, I do not believe we need to add one more thing to our family's plate, period. I do not, I will not vote for an option C at this time. Um, I, I don't mind entertaining pulling a committee together, but I do believe pulling a committee together at this time is kind of difficult giving all the other decisions and, and activities that staff and families are engaging in right now. I think it's a wonderful idea. I'm just not uh, sold that it's something that we need to do right now. I don't think it's, it's high priority to pull a committee together to talk about an extended calendar. calendar. I think the priority is to get the community's feedback on the calendar that we're going to be voting on soon. Uh, and so that's my that's my comment on that. I do want to talk to the public right now. I want to thank everyone um, for providing their comments to me about the calendar in addition to the survey, which is very helpful, but there is nothing that's going to replace a conversation with families on how they feel and how they would be impacted uh, by pre or post. And so for everyone watching Highland Springs, Sanson, Verona, please continue to meet with me, have conversations with me. I'm gonna do and explore every single communication medium possible to allow you to do that, because I know that it is a challenge for us to have face-to-face -face conversations right now. And on something as important as this calendar, please continue to reach out to me to have discussions about it in whatever fashion, way, or form that you can. Pastor Cooper, the floor is yours. I believe Reverend Cooper has been disconnected and will uh, be rejoining us. He's lost his internet connection. So we'll just pause as he's reconnecting. I'm back. <laughs> Thank you, Reverend Cooper. And uh, Mrs. Atkins just uh, finished sharing her comments related to the importance of that community conversation around the calendar. Is, is anybody else have any more comments on it? I do, Reverend Cooper, if I could yes, jump back in. If you could, yes, ma'am. Um, um, I, I just I agree with um, basically we're all kind of uh, chiming in with the same sort of thought that um, if we are going to consider an an extended um, school year, I think that is so far from ready to for us to vote on. I don't know that if we delayed that to the fall, we would be ready. I, so my thought would be that in that our, at our next meeting, we're choosing between A and B. I think that is all that we have the information to choose from at this point. Um, if we're going to vote uh, this month, I, I think option C with an extended year, that takes a tremendous amount of planning and uh, that is just so not ready for prime time. But um, I would feel comfortable um, 
in two weeks voting between A and B. I don't know that our survey um, is, is if um, Mrs. Shea's survey idea really focused in on that, or I would be interested in, in knowing whether her information that she's looking for really is centering on a year round effort, or is it really on the A and B? Because if, you know, we've had um, a tremendous amount of time for people to have input between pre and post uh, Labor Day start. Um, the option C with the year round throws a tremendous um, monkey wrench in the whole thing. So I, I think we're, my vote would be to, or my suggestion would be to take that off the table right now for anything we would vote on and choose between pre and post Labor Day. Um, but I'm, I'm fine with putting that off till June or whatever anybody feels comfortable with. If so, I may interject. Yes, ma'am, please go ahead. Um, so, oh, I forgot to turn my camera on, sorry. Uh, so even if, it, so if we take C off the table, I still think it's really important to have additional survey input between oh. A and B because okay. I have talked to a lot of families and, and even in neighboring school districts that before were really opposed to a pre-Labor Day start and now they're realizing, well, maybe maybe that I do want a pre-Labor Day start or vice versa. And so um, I think a lot of community um, opinion on this has shifted and, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe it hasn't shifted, but I think we uh, need the opportunity to look at if it has shifted and if so, how it has shifted as a result of this COVID pandemic. So Mr. Chairman, if I might. Please, because we want to get, so, get a consensus. It, well, it sounds like what I'm hearing from the board is that um, while we were asked to provide a view of what a, an extended year calendar might look like just to aid in today's discussion, that that's no longer an option that's on the table um, and that we would like to focus on looking at calendar options A and B, serving the public regarding the pre and post Labor Day start. And so that's certainly something we could do. I will add, and, and, it, and I could be mistaken, that I believe there's been some surveying done related to that before, and uh, I've found a pretty split view across the community um, and would say that, um, you know, while we did start some conversation with the community about the idea of a pre-Labor Day start, and it's not as drastic a shift as a, the option C we saw, it, it is a significant departure. And so um, my caution, and, and again, the reason my recommendation to the board uh, regarding a calendar for the 2021 school year was to focus on, on calendar B was still my concern that we can't fully um, educate the community about the pros and cons of, of each schedule and, and can simply ask them the question. And so um, I, there's always the importance of asking and retrieving survey results, but when constituents haven't had an opportunity to really, again, attend information sessions and learn about what a pre-Labor Day start can do, I wonder if the vote isn't reflective of of all the knowledge we'd want our folks to have, but certainly are prepared to put out um, a survey uh, related to uh, the pre and the post Labor Day start and adjust the window of time uh, beyond May 28th, should that be the board's will to the June date. Mr. Chairman, and, I, I just thought of one other thing I need to ask if I can jump in one more. Yes, yeah, thing. please do. Um, I think one other thing we have to consider with a pre Labor Day, post Labor Day start is we have three schools who are supposed to open um, that September that we're talking about in 21. So um, I think part of our decision has to be, will those three schools be ready to open several weeks earlier? If they would not be, I think that would influence our decision greatly. Um, not that you wanna affect the whole county for the, uh, the status of three schools, but um, you know, under the circumstances with the economy like it is with, I, I know that they're continuing <laughs> on with all three projects, but maybe part of what the information we re need right now is a status update of those three projects and a projection of, as to a completion date, mm -hmm. um, would help us inform our decision. 
Well, and I, I think that's a great point, Mrs. Ogburn, and, and one we alluded to when we first presented option A and B, um, even prior to the COVID uh, crisis, uh, there was some concern that a pre-Labor Day start could impact uh, the promise we made to those school communities to be in their new buildings in the opening of the 21 school year. So while uh, those construction projects are on track right now, we understand that there is, uh, given the uh, situation with the economy, the potential for those to fall on or off schedule. Um, um, and of course, that could happen even outside of a crisis for any number of reasons, weather related. But while they're on track today, I would have concern that we, we may not be able to stay on track. Um, and of course, recognizing that even in the best case scenario, these were expedited projects that typically take longer than the timeline we allotted uh, for delivering two new high schools in the fall of 21. And so in the original construction schedule, um, they were planned as if the move-in date was for a post-Labor Day start. And so, you know, there may be um, some adjusting that would need to happen related to not having uh, folks move into the new buildings um, prior to that first day of school. So it's an important consideration, particularly for the 2021 year. And uh, Chairman Cooper, may I share a few remarks? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So Dr. Cashwell, um, thank you for responding to Mickey's question. It is an excellent one. Um, I think in addition to that, I'd love to share with the board some of the feedback that um, I've received just as recent as this week uh, during my coffee and um, conversations gathering. And so that did come up. And I will tell you, every last person that I that was in the, that conversation agreed that they want something sort of normal to hold on to, which is that post Labor Day <laughs> start. And, uh, you know, it wasn't a shocker for me. However, um, I do think sometimes, uh, you know, if I if I went with my own thoughts, I would have said, well, let's do pre labor. It gives our kids an opportunity to catch up. However, I don't sit in the seat to just represent my thoughts. I sit in the seat to represent an entire district. And we all sit in our seats to represent an entire district. And therefore, with the conversations that I've been having, that has been the steady trend. Please don't change anything, because that's something that we know how to plan to, because that's what it's been for so many years. Uh, and so I will share, if, if we did have to take a vote in May, I can already tell you it would be the post. It would be the B. I'm going to continue to get feedback, but that's the trend um, that I have seen thus far. Hearing that there's a possibility that any of these new schools, these schools that are in construction, would struggle more than what they are going to. There are going to be some things that happen because of the economy and delays. I do not want to add any more stress uh, in those situations. And so that is actually something that, that has significantly made me want to say, if we need to vote, I can say right now confidently on behalf of my community, because I've had those conversations without a survey, uh, that that's what they would want. And it's also what I would want. Uh, and so I'm speaking to that because if we are questioning whether or not to move the date back, uh, I think it's a healthy conversation we need to have. My comment earlier, was if we decide to do a survey, I would not use the past survey because the past survey environment was, was critically different, significantly different when those folks are surveyed. So when you're answering a question, you're answering it usually based on your history and your current situation and what you predict for the future. I don't think that is going, the results of that survey is significant or irrelevant right now uh, because folks that would answer that survey certainly could not have predicted any of this, and we don't even have any history on this. So um, really, my, my response is, if we do push the date back for voting, it is only to allow time for folks to take the survey and to give time to analyze the results. Chairman Cooper, I'm done. Thank you so much, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Um, um, Atkins. Uh, Madam Superintendent, after hearing the dialogue and discussion, um, what is your recommendation before we can go forward? Uh, you know, certainly, as I stated, administration's recommendation for a number of factors each board member has brought up related to whether it be um, some unknowns over the construction timeline specific to the 21 year, uh, the um, inability to fully engage our 
um, community and dialogue, not just get input uh, via a survey. Um, you know, our recommendation is that uh, the board consider option B, but if there is a feeling that it's time to um, have our community weigh in via a survey related to option A and B, um, we'll certainly be prepared to do that. So, um, you know, I, I look to the board to guide us as to what, what would be preferable moving forward. Well, it sounds like the, the, the consensus is they want a, a mechanism in place to, to garner and to, to get uh, feedback. So we need to look at how we can do that. So, um, so that I fully understand the ask, I, we staff will prepare a survey for families to weigh in on options A and B, a pre and post Labor Day start for the 21 school year and have that data to the board prior to May 28th. So mm -hmm. that um, you can consider, so for May 28th, you'll be considering that feedback as you vote related to the calendars. Ms. Shea, is that amenable for you? Yes, sir. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kinsella, is that amenable for you? I, it, it, I would agree with that as long as um, it's very clear that option C is taken off the table. Um, yes, I'm, I'm okay with that because we have done um, surveys in the past. We do a survey every time we make a calendar decision. We always provide the public with a survey. Um, and we did receive so much feedback already that you know pre or post labor day is a conversation we've been having for a couple of years depending on the year so i'm fine with it thank you yes ma'am thank you mrs agra i'm fine with it um as well it, it it comes back to us by the next meeting but i would um challenge mr jinks to make some to make an all call to like all the homes or put and put it out on social media that we're doing this Two weeks is not a lot of time to do a survey and to get the results back and to analyze them. So we're talking about a short window here. So it's going to take some um, some media help to get the word out that we're even doing a survey um, at this point in time. I think that may be um, hard to get people to understand what we're doing. Well, and I would add that certainly, you know, around the messaging, while again, it's not introducing an option C, it, it is a departure for the community. And I think that while um, in, in putting out a survey that shows a pre and a post for the 21 school year, I think while families will respond, there are going to be some strong feelings out there. And I would imagine the board will hear from uh, a good number of folks since we haven't spent a lot of time with our community on that pre-Labor Day conversation because we closed uh, when we would have been engaging them in that dialogue. So for some families, the first they're going to hear of this is, is via survey. And I just, I just want to make that clear to the board. I think the reaction could be strong in some cases um, because we haven't had an opportunity to dialogue as we typically would. Thank you so much, um, Madam Superintendent. Uh, Ms., Ms. Atkins, are you amenable to it as well? Um, and so I have some, um, I, I agree with the survey, but I'm going to reiterate um, when we are doing polls or surveys, the results are only as good as the understanding of the questions. And I say that very strongly because two weeks is not a lot of time. You know, when you're asking someone a question, they have to understand the background and the impact before they answer the question, or otherwise the results that we receive won't truly help us. They, they won't be as genuine as what I would hope we would want them to be. And, and so to Mickey's point, um, we are going to have to be incredibly creative and intentional because just because you're gonna send out a survey, if we don't adequately educate folks on the implications of, of the calendar, if we don't adequately share that if we do pre, we wanna tell folks, well, that might impact construction. It may, so my point to you is, um, I am okay with doing a survey if it's done in a very genuine way that educate folks on the questions that they are answering. 
If you just send a survey with a paragraph, hey, pick one, the results aren't going to be meaningful because folks may not have the understanding of the impacts. And it does take time to educate folks. We've been on this call having this topic for several minutes, and we have all engaged in it. This is an example. And I, I don't want to continue to stay on this topic, but I just want you to know how passionate I am that you don't just send out a survey and ask folks to answer a question in two weeks without educating them and empowering them to understand the meaning behind the question. And two weeks yeah. is not a lot of time. So My, to make uh, this point, we're going to have to use every single medium possible to educate folks first before giving them a survey. You can't just say, hey, guys, take this survey. Tell us what you think, because the, the results are not going to be as meaningful as they would be if they were educated about the topic. Yeah, I think great point, Mrs. Atkins, and, and certainly why our initial plan had a number of face-to-face -face community forums, you'll recall, before we would have looked to get to a vote at this point. Um, again, why I pulled the pre-Labor Day um, option off the table as far as my recommendation goes, because I worry about being able to have that dialogue. But it sounds like they're certainly interested in the board, interest um, on the part of the board in hearing the community's thoughts related to pre and post Labor Day um, at this point in time. So um, I certainly can say that, you know, staff and I can work on drafting a survey and sharing that with the board and see if it may meet your needs um, in the next day or so and determine whether maybe once you see what a draft looks like, uh, whether that's the direction you still want to go. And we can certainly um, wait to hear from you on that front. So, Madam, Madam, Madam Superintendent, let me say this because I want to move on from this discussion. Um, can you please expeditiously um, um, develop the survey, send it to us, allow us to look at it and get feedback, and then we'll move forward from there. Can you do that for me? Yes, I okay. will provide a survey uh, looking yeah. at pre and post Labor Day. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Reverend Madam. Co Reverend yes. Cooper, I know we want to move on, not to belabor this point, but may I add one more thought? Yes, ma'am, if so, you can. Um, so I, I certainly hear Ms. Atkins' concerns, and if I, I don't know if we feel like some sort of virtual town hall on the subject would provide adequate ed education for our community, um, but I personally don't feel comfortable voting on the calendar without community input. So I don't know what we've got to do to get to, from point A to point B to educate our community appropriately, but I, I personally feel that um, public input um, is essential and post-COVID public input, as opposed to just looking at our pre-COVID input, <coughs> is essential. And that's and I'll stop on that. And, and again, I just want to be clear that I was asking for a vote on. I would be asking for a vote on calendar B, but the board would like to also consider A, and therefore need the input to make the vote. Yes, and Reverend Cooper. If you don't mind, I'm going to jump in and make a suggestion that. I don't know, might help all of this. Um, it yeah, seems yeah, to me yeah. that that there is some concern about, obviously from Ms. Atkins has expressed so well, the concern about two weeks is not a lot of time. Um, Dr. Cashwell, is there any rush why we have to vote in May? Could we put the vote off till June to on the calendar to our first meeting in June and give us a little more time to educate the public on the survey and what we're asking them to tell us about. Uh, does it really make a difference if we put it off uh, and do this in four weeks as opposed to two? I think it's certainly we can postpone it and make it clear to the public. I know this is a highly anticipated um, outcome. A number of our families have been asking whether we would be moving to a pre or post Labor Day for the 21 year, and we had given them a time frame in which we'd make that decision, but we're not extending it drastically to go from the last meeting in May to that next meeting in June. So, I mean, certainly if that's the board's will, we will extend that. Um, I won't ask for a vote until the following meeting. So that allows more time to survey and perhaps um, pr provide some opportunities to um, do more than survey, but also share information with our families related to what a pre Labor Day start might entail. I think that's a good compromise, uh, Madam Superintendent. Does that meet your your criteria, Ms. Ogburn? Absolutely. I think okay. it would help, and I think it would help with educating our families i think alicia's point is absolutely spot on that we have to we have to tell them what their what the pros and the cons to this change are but it also uh, achieves what uh, Ms. shea is trying to achieve in getting feedback so 
delaying, I think delaying to the first meeting in June, there's not a whole lot of difference. And if we make it known that transparency and communication is the reason for the delay, people will go, good, I'm glad you did that. If I may, Chair Cooper? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Gonzalez. Just, just to uh, fully support what Ms. Ogborn just said, just to transparency um, and full disclosure, make it very clear um, that these are the two options because we have had people, um, I know personally, I've heard quite a bit about the calendar conversation and folks wanting to know, as a lot of folks are put in a position with COVID this summer, um, they're looking at rescheduling, rebooking, um, and credits being issued for next summer for vacations that were supposed to happen this summer. So um, I just want it to be as clear as possible that we will vote in June and that we've extended it because the original vote actually was supposed to be April 23rd, if I'm not mistaken. So um, just as long as we can make it clear that we've extended it and exactly we've the difference here is just a, a rollback of two weeks or post Labor Day. So thank you, Chair. Yes. Okay, Dr. Caswell. Yes, uh, draft survey will be forthcoming to the board and um, we'll not be seeking a vote until June. So does that conclude questions related to the calendar item? That would be our June 18th meeting, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I was just pulling the calendar to see exactly yeah. right, the 18th. Sounds good. All right, madam, are we are we ready, y'all, to um, move on to our next item on the agenda, um, which I believe um, will be policy revisions, Madam Superintendent? That's correct, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Um, what I'm asking is that the board waive the 30-day review period and approve the proposed revision to policy P7-09-004 graduation requirements because the revision in policy is ne necessitated by a legislative change. And I um, will turn the floor over should Mrs. Gumpel or Dr. Teigen um, have any information to add to that before I ask for your approval? Or should you have any questions before I seek your approval? Any questions from- um, any questions? Okay. Seeing as there are no questions um, or comments, um, I, can I entertain a motion and a second um, for the approval of the revision? So moved. <laughs> it's been moved by Mr. Shea, is there a second? Second. Second. Seconded by Ms. Kinsella. I'll now do a roll call vote. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The policy revisions are approved. Thank you. Next, I'm recommending that the school board accept the Virginia Department of Education's Career and Technical Education Competitive Innovative Program Equipment for High Demand and Fast Growth Industry Sectors Grant Award of $37,500 to the Advanced Career Education Center at Hermitage. Thank you, Madam um, Superintendent. Um, questions or comments from any of my peers? Hearing none. Um, can I please entertain a motion and second? So moved. Been moved by Ms. Atkins. There, second. Second. Second by Mrs. Ogborn. I'll do a roll call vote. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Consella. Aye. Ms. Ogborn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. Um, it is the grant award is accepted. Thank you. Next, I'm recommending the school board accept the $700 grant award to Ratcliffe Elementary School from the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute and School Library Journal. Oh, man, that's awesome. Um, any questions or comments? <laughs> I wish I could do the motion, but I can't. Um, none I'll being heard. For you. Thank, who the said the, the, Ms. Ms. Ogborn has made the motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Kinsella. I'll do roll call vote. Ms. Atkins. Aye. Ms. Kinsella. Aye. Ms. Ogburn. Aye. Ms. Shea. Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The grant award has been accepted. Thank you. Next, I'm recommending the school board review the 2020-2021 fee schedule for the secondary and career and technical education students. So we, um, uh, Mr. Sorensen is going to provide a brief overview of that. Thanks, Dr. Cashwell. 
the list of fees before you are for uh, certain classes that students choose to take for certain uh, activities that they participate in. We are recommending two fee increases for the next school year. Both fee increases are due to costs being passed on uh, to us to operate the program. Uh, the two fees involve practical nursing. This I'm on page two, kind of in the middle. Uh, practical nursing going from 315 to 325 and veterinary services one going from $45 to $85. And again, both of those fee increases are for costs uh, that, that, uh, that were passed on to the students to operate the program. And I would add that we're not seeking your approval for this fee schedule um, now, but will be at the May 28th meeting, but wanted to provide that in advance, be able to answer any questions you may have um, now and of course between now and then. Thank you, Mr. Sorensen. Thank you so much, Madam Superintendent. Any questions from my peers? I have a comment, Chair yes, Cooper. Ma yes, ma'am, Ms. Kinsella. I would just like to say that I, I fully support a flat fee structure with the exception of these two items, um, especially given the current economic situation and our budget shortfalls. So thank you so much for, for just these two increases. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else? Yeah, I have two comments. Thanks for entertaining me. Yes, ma'am, Mr. Shea, our, please. Our two questions. The first question is around the IB fee. So the secondary IB fee is $20. Um, and in comparison to an AP fee of $93 to cover the exam, do IB students also pay a fee to take their exam or is that covered by the county under that $20? I do not know the answer to that question. I would have to get that for you. All right, thank I, I'm just looking at the at, at balancing between IB, AP, and dual enrollment, where dual enrollment's 50, AP's 93 if they choose to take the exam, and just kind of wondering um, what that IB fee of $20 entails. Uh, my second question has to do with the equity of fees uh, in the county. And, and, and so I'm going to use the science fee as an example because that's one near and dear to my heart that, uh, that I utilize as a science teacher. Um, and we know that all students enrolled in science classes are, are expected to pay that $5. But we also know that um, in different parts of the county, there are, are significant students that have their fees waived be, uh, from an inability um, to pay to pay that money. And so we end up with an inequity across the county with um, some science departments. And this is not just limited to science. It's it's, you know, a lot of our other departmental fees as well. But, um, you know, some of our science departments are able to buy a lot more equipment um, than other departments are because of the number of students that pay their fee. So um, I know this has been a consideration of the superintendent, um, which I truly appreciate. Um, can either um, Mr. Sorensen or Dr. Cashwell update us on, on, on kind of the state of, of the equity of fees? I'm happy sure. to speak to it. Or Mr. Sorensen, go ahead. No, I was going to say, as, as you said, Ms. Shea, that, that was something that was important to the superintendent. And, and we had been, it was a goal of ours to eliminate fees, not only to provide relief to families, but also to uh, make the distribution of funds more equitable. And of course, that effort's been stalled now somewhat by the economy. However, there are some, some monies at central office that uh, some of the instructional specialists can uh, give to schools to help balance some, some of those inequities. Yeah, I mean, I think exactly what Mr. Sorensen said. We um, we are not able to make the strides we had hoped to in readjusting our budget accordingly, and and as we had planned to do in a number of areas, and including reducing some of the fees all of our families pay. Um, but are very mindful that there are some inequities that exist in this um, area, and as you say, not just science. And looking at those departmental needs, school to school, and making sure that as we can, we can fill in those gaps um, with central resources. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Um, anyone else have any comments? I, I do have an answer for the IB question. I, I don't believe that's for an IB exam, but there are some fellowship experiences and other experiences that IB students participate in. Um, so it's not just all exams that those costs cover going from AP to IB. Uh, with AP, we know the fees may be associated with the exam. Of course, with the dual enrollment, it's to receive the college credit. And then of course, for the other, uh, for IB, it's to participate in, in some of those programs rather than IB exams. 
So do the students the pay additional fees for the IB exams? No, I don't believe there's an additional cost for those. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, um, thank you, Mrs. Kinsella, and thank you again, Mrs. Shea. Um, Madam Superintendent, can you pr proceed? Yes, the last item I have is a request that the school board award an annual contract to Facility Dynamics Engineering for engineering commissioning services for projects in accordance with RFP number 19-1951-12JOK. Thank you so much, Madam Superintendent. Um, um, colleagues, are there any questions or comments? Ms. Shea? No comments. Ms. Wyburn? No comment. Ms. Kinsella? No comments. Ms. Atkins? No comments. Ms. Atkins? <laughs> Thank you. Since there, are, since there are no comments or questions or concern, can I um, entertain a motion and second, please? So moved. So it's been moved by Mrs. Kinsella and seconded by Mrs. Shea. I will now proceed with the roll call vote. Ms. Atkins? Aye. Ms. Kinsella? Aye. Ms. Ogburn? Aye. Ms. Shea? Aye. And I vote aye. The ayes have it. The grant award is accepted. Does that conclude business from the superintendent? Yes, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. That concludes items from the superintendent. Thank you so much for your three to four hours of <laughs> presentations today. I think really it's five. <laughs> five. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. I was being facetious. Uh, next item on our agenda is our public forum. Uh, citizens had until 9.30 this morning to submit comments um, for the board's review. I'm using a link on our HCPS uh, website. Um, and we were in receipt of 15 public comments uh, that were uh, received. Uh, 15 citizens took advantage of that opportunity. And I want to say from myself and the board members that we are so appreciative of your effort and for your input. Uh, Ms. Harris, our deputy clerk, compiled the input and provided it to us prior to the start of today's meeting. I mean, it has also been posted in board docs. If you weren't able to share your comments with us today's, for today's meeting, uh, you are certainly welcome to provide input for our next meeting, which will take place and transpire on May the 28th by going to the school board's page on the HCPS website and clicking on the box to submit comments for the next available public forum. Um, colleagues, are is there any unfinished business? Hearing none, uh, is there any new business that uh, needs to be presented to the school board? Uh, Chairman Cooper? Yes, ma'am, Mrs. Atkins. I do want to to share uh, some wonderful news uh, about uh, something that's coming to our schools. I'm excited about it. Each school in the Varina District, Academies at Virginia Randolph, and Newbridge Learning Center will receive brand new navy blue customized Kindness for Kate benches. Uh, they will be installed over the summer. I actually have received the name plates for each of these businesses right here in my own home. And so uh, it's, it's a project that Mrs. Childry, which is the founder of Kindness for Kate and I, we've been meeting over the past few months with the intentional purpose of spreading kindness and establishing ways of utilizing the benches to remind students, staff, and families that kind acts touch everyone. And I wanted to make sure that I, I took this opportunity to share that with the public. Thank well, you. Well, we want to say that is awesome. We are so excited. And I know the members of the community will definitely um, um, be appreciative of that. Anyone else? Uh, Reverend Cooper, I would love to take a brief point of personal privilege. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Shea, please take it. I would just like to um, deeply thank our clerks, Ms. Ward and Ms. Harris, as, long, as well as our technology team and video team um, who are making this live stream happen. Um, I don't know if the public is aware, but they are in person at Newbridge putting all the pieces together to make sure our virtual live stream can reach all of our constituents. So thank you um, to all those individuals making this happen. We concur with your comments. Thank you for sharing them. Anyone else? Well, then, then um, I want to make an announcement of our meeting date. The school board's next meeting will be at 1 p.m. virtual work session on May the 28th, 2020. The meeting time may be adjusted if needed. 
that being said, thank you again. This meeting is adjourned.